Coco Talk would like to thank the patrons who sponsor our show. So our heartfelt gratitude goes out to Al Hartman, Alan Murphy, Alan Huffman, Amigos Retro Gaming, Blair Ledoux, Brendan Donaghy, Brian Weasler, Karen Anscombe, D. Bruce Moore, Davey Mitchell, Diego, Eric Canales, Glenn Hewlett, Graham Vebke, Grant Leedy, Henry Strickland, Jason Downs, Jenna Farron, Ken Reichert, Kyle Etter, Malfunct, Michael Pitsley, Rick Eulin, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, Paul Thayer, Rob Inman, Stephen Wagner, Steve Batson, Steve Rasmussen, Terry Steen, Terry Steggy, The Backyard Shed Gang, Tom C., Tom S., Tim Lindner, Tom Heron, and Tony C. Thank you ever so much, patrons. Coco Talk is an unscripted live broadcast. Anything can and will happen. The views and opinions expressed by members of the panel and the live audience are their own and not necessarily those of the Coco Talk show, its sponsors, affiliates, or subsidiaries. Open minds encourage, sense of humor recommended. If any off color comments were made, we're sorry. Hi, this is Dale Leader, designer of TRS 80 Color Baseball, and you're listening to Coco Talk. This is Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Calor computer. It's time to drop your socks. Grab your real-time clocks, and let's rock. Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the Tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Coco Talk, episode 224. We've got some special guests. We've got some announcements. We've got some promotions. We've got some assembly. We've got some news. Are you excited? I know I am. It's almost like I've done this before. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Good at time of day to at you. We are here on the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Calor computer, Coco Talk. We've got a panel of people. We've got things to talk about, things to show, things to tell, things to do, all kinds of stuff. So we'll go around the room real quick and say hello. And by the way, I'm your special guest host today, um, making a random appearance on the program. Stevie Stroh is here. Uh, I begged and pleaded uh, for a second chance because I know Grant fired me last week, but I did appeal. <laughs> there was an appeals committee. There was a right to work whole thing going on, and uh, I think it's still up in the air, but I'm on probation, so we'll see how I do today. So on the panel today from sunny Arizona, Ron Delvo. Oh, hello, Ron. Hello. We've got the man who assembles and fills our mind and blows our mind. George Jansen is here. Hello, George. Good morning. I don't know about all that stuff you just said, but we'll try. All right. We got a man whose name is so nice, we must say it thrice. Go on once, go on twice. It's none other than Nick Marotta. Hello, Nick Marotta. How are you? Hey, good, Stevie. Thank you. It's good mm. to be here. Hey, everybody. From the Great White North in O Canada, it is L Curtis Boyle. How's it going, E? Eh? Hello, everyone. A lot of exciting stuff on the show today, and a lot of exciting stuff happening on the show over the next few weeks. So, absolutely. Stay tuned. I missed your um, uh, life story, and I don't have time to hear it again today. But Duncan Bell, <laughs> welcome back to the program. I'm going to have to watch the replay because I know you joined us a week or so ago. Thank you for being here again. Thank you very much. I missed it last week. Okay, we have Rick Eulin with us. How you doing, Rick? Pretty good here and ready to solder your cocoa. All right, and Curtis's hair for no less than that. <laughs> Rocky Hill, Pedro Pena is here. Hello, Pedro. Hey, everybody. We Good have uh, Curtis Boyles, partner in crime, fellow Canadian. Bill Noble, eh? How's it going, eh? Hello, everybody. 
Well, we have a member of the Amigos Retro Gaming and other podcasts and shows and streams. John Boat of Car Schaller is here. Hello, John. Hi, everybody. We have a new member to our Discord community, which we'll get to hear a little bit about today. Kevin's here. Hey, Kevin, how you doing? How you doing? Excellent, excellent. Our resident Apple guy, Mark Overholzer, is here. How you doing, Mark? Hey there. Glad to be here. The guy who fired me, Grant Leedy's here. Hey, how's it going? And Stevie, you're fired. All right, thank you. And Grant will be picking up part two of the stream. Grant knows a little bit about streaming. He's drinking right now just to f build up the He's flow prepping. of that there. Uh, Exiled in Paradise, Alan Murphy's here. How are you, Alan? Greetings, Planet Earth. Doing fine. Atari Leaf are. is out there in the live stream, a uh, YouTube celebrity. How are you doing there, Atari Leaf? And uh, I'm wondering how this guy feels emotionally about being here today. David Ladd, how do you feel about being here and being on the show today? Well, I'm alive and I'm here. I'm not sleeping, so therefore I must be at least in some form of progress. So hopefully the show will stay on the rails and we'll get to see where everything goes. All You're going right. to be so disappointed, Dave. All right. And <laughs> last but certainly not least, the thunder from down under, the owner of many Ferraris, the maker of a Coco game every three to four days. He's like the Jim Gary of Coco games at this point. Nick Morentes is here. Hello, Nick. Hello, world. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, one of the... Um, one of the people here, which we'll get a brief introduction to, who's new to Discord. And we're, by the way, we're going to play who's new to Discord. Um, but we'll hear a little bit about a project he's working on. And then we do have some updates and acquisitions to talk about, some teasers and other things like that. But Mr. Kevin, um, your name on Discord is, again, remind us for everybody, it's something 256. Yeah, it's... Uh Dundee 256. Dundee 256. That's not a knife. That's a knife. Um, <laughs> so you don't have to give us your whole life story, but if you want to just tell us a little about, about maybe the project you're working on that brought you to our Discord server or whatever you want to say. Yeah, so um, I'm actually, uh, I went back to school for uh, my master's and uh, for my master's thesis, um, I am building a uh, pipeline uh, 6809 microprocessor IP. Um, so this is something that would be implemented in a uh, FPGA or a ASIC. Um, and so uh, there are other 6809 microprocessor cores out there um, that have been used in like the Cocoa FPGA and, and similar. Uh, but my approach is a little bit different. I'm actually taking it just, just the instruction set and I'm implementing it as fast as I can. So basically, um, you know, using modern tech techniques like uh, modern uh, SOC but, uh, but buses, pipeline, uh, pipelining techniques, micro micro coded techniques uh, to essentially get uh, a more efficient cycle for cycle as well as a higher uh, frequency uh, max. Um, so yeah, so it, it's it's. Uh, um, it's I'm 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 basically trying to make it as professional as possible. So like it's a, it's open source uh, uh, core, but I'm also doing a, f a full uh, self check checking test bench. Uh, I have a a, f a friend of mine, uh, Michael Rywald, is also on the pro project. So that's what what he's working on is the uh, is the self checking test bench. So it runs through all the in all the instructions with all the uh, addressing mode combinations and. Uh, test each one with with uh, directed and randomized uh, uh, sequences. So it's not just you know a hobbyist project. We're trying to really um, make it something that uh, you know you guys can use as well as industry. So that's neat. So so people who know how to write six eight zero nine assembly and George J is doing a series on that, teaching people you can take those assembly instructions and run it on something modern at mm -hmm. wicked wicked fast speeds. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And it's called Turbo Nine, right? Is that the name of the project? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. And um, and thank you for uh, for joining us on Discord. And hopefully, there are some people who are helping you a little bit. And I'm sure what you're working on is going to help others. That's that whole community thing. Yeah, we, I appreciate everything uh, that the Coco community has preserved because I've uh, definitely a lot of documents and stuff like that that I've been able to reference that uh, you guys have preserved for us. Just out of curiosity, why did you pick the 6809 of all things when you could have picked any processor? Um, so I come from a history of a HC11, HC12, 
and uh, as an undergrad, I made a, uh, a HC12 uh, softcore processor uh, that was uh, purely multi-cycle. It wasn't pipeline. And uh, so that was like 10 years ago. So over my course of 10 years, I, in the back of my mind, I've always wanted to do it better. So uh, when I came back to it, I looked at the different 6800 uh, architectures out there and chose the 6809 because it's, 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 more, it's more powerful, but it's also a little bit... Uh, more uh, stream streamlined. Like if you look at like the HC12, you could argue that it's a better in instruction set, but there's also a bunch of stuff in the HC12 that is unnecessary. So yeah. Okay, interesting. Well, we're glad you, we're glad to have you. you. Go ahead, Ron. Did you ever did you ever own a color computer back in the day? No. So I I think I'm like about ten years older than the I mean ten years younger than the average Coco uh, enthusiast. I'm 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 forty. Uh, but I actually just bought two Coco 3s a couple months ago, um, and I I haven't set them up. Did uh, you have to mortgage your house to buy those? No, luckily, <laughs> luckily I got I, I, guess, I guess it was more than a couple months ago, but it wasn't too bad when I bought them. I know okay. lately they've gone up a lot, so yeah. yeah. I, have, I haven't actually turned them on yet, and I'm, I, I'm ashamed to admit that, but... Uh, That's okay. Yeah. Well, you're going to want to get an SDC. And... Uh, let's not scare the guy away at this point. No, uh, I, uh... <laughs> I, have an, I have an SDC. I have oh, dear. One. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boise Boise sent me one. And uh, uh, um, and uh, his, 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 other, his other friend, he was able to get me a, uh, was it an S-cart to HDMI converter. So I, okay. have no ex I have no excuses. Okay. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but Kevin, would you be willing to come on for a more in-length interview on the project itself sometime yes. in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Because I have a ton of questions, but I didn't want to take up the whole yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, we have, we, have right a lot, now, so. we have a lot of show to get to today, and we have a lot of other shows to do. So before we get into the project updates and acquisitions part of that, we're going to do some plugs and promos because there's a lot of stuff coming on here in the next three weeks. I've been, you know, I've been busy with a lot of stuff around my house, so I haven't been able to be on the show, but I've been behind the scenes on things and. Uh, one of the biggest things coming up is our Dragon uh, promo, our Dragon special, which Curtis has been working tire tirelessly on. And um, so I have posted that promo out in most of the places. Whether or not you've seen it, you're going to see it again because we're going to run it here. And also we have a Who's New to Discord. So we're going to run a few promo segments and then we'll get into project updates and acquisitions. So let's start off with Who's New to Discord. That Oh, crap. Where... Is it under commercials? Where I where did I put it in my stream deck? Okay, I found it. Here we go. Here we go. It's time for everyone's favorite segment. Who's new to Discord this week? Please welcome Gamer Moose Dan. I've been into retro gaming, retro computing scene on forums since 2002. Computer-wise, I've grown up with the Coco since my dad brought one home back in 1981, declaring it the future. Hobby-wise, I've done a bunch of writing for Digital Press and Video Game Trader Magazine. I found the Coco Talk Discord following a link from the Atari Age Forum. Tim Bukas says, I hail from the land of the related dragons. I've been a listener to the podcast for a while. I ran a software house back in the 80s. We only had one dragon product that made it out the door. Ask me how I learned to have a better backup regime sometime. I have also added a few expansion cards to my fleet of dragons, and I keep threatening to finish that 6809 code I wrote back in the 80s. Grigo says, I'm here to get advice and get connected with other Coco users. I have things I want to know about the Coco as I am inexperienced with them. Ed Rhodes is looking for information on using the VCC emulator. His kid actually showed him how to get the emulators going. John Vela says, I found this Discord server on the Coco Talk website which I found from a YouTube comment. My first computer was a Dragon 32, which directly led to my career in IT. And I suspect I will always have a soft spot for that machine. I like meeting new people with shared interests and I don't take myself too seriously. Brian Walsh found this server when he found Coco Talk on YouTube. His first computer for his 10th birthday was a Coco back in 1980, a 4K machine with standard basic. Over the next several years, fell in love with programming and even learned to code a little bit of machine language to speed things up. Also went to several Rainbow Fest and manned the Mitchtron booth, hoping that being a part of this Discord will allow him to more thoroughly enjoy the stroll down memory lane by interacting with people who share passions for 8-bit computing. Pernod Nigel says, I'm the main developer that looks after the Dragon machines. 
just making myself available here for the upcoming Dragon edition of Coco Talk. The Veda Project, Richard, says I mostly work on dragon preservation with my website. I'm also contributing to the main dragon archive. I was just talking to Curtis and Steve ahead of the dragon special and they suggested I pop in here to see what's going on. Jell found us through Sloopy Malibu and is hoping to learn assembly. Duncan Styles mostly works with CPC and Amiga, but enjoys checking out other systems of the era. He never owned a Coco, but he does remember trying to convert some basic program from a Dragon to the CPC, which failed. He's got a couple of pals named John and Aaron from the Amigos Retro Gaming, wonder who they are, who put out a podcast called The Coco Show, and they've asked him if he would join to help keep the Coco community informed of their latest episodes. I'm pretty sure we know who they are, but glad to have you here. Noctivius, Brandon, I ported the Coco 3 Balls program Mr. Bjork presented on YouTube to the Vetrex, I'm learning about assembly on the Coco World seems to have great learning resources for me. Dundee 256 Kevin says, I'm developing the Turbo 9 for my master's thesis. It's a pipeline 6809 processor for the SOC FPGA. Rywalt says, I'm working with Dundee 256 and both work on his Turbo 9 project and more software centric pieces. J Thurman 9673 James says, I grew up with the Color Computer 2 in the 80s through the 90s. I decided to get back into the Cocoa as a hobby to keep myself sane during local restrictions. I am learning things I did not get to as a kid, such as OS 9. YouTube recommended Cocoa Talk during the lockdown last year, and I have been watching since. I am hoping to find answers to questions while relearning the Cocoa. And as always, we'd like to give a special thanks to Boyson Technologies. Paul Fiscarelli, Terry Steggy with Data Soup, and our Coco Talk patrons for boosting the Discord server. You can join us on Discord by going to discord.cocotalk.live. See y'all on Discord. Hi, I'm Chris Poacher, and I created the Facebook group MicroDo the 8 Bit Years. If you look over my shoulder, you can see I got a near complete collection of all the 8 bit titles released by MicroDo from 1981 to 89. Uh, I'm from Wales myself, as you can probably guess by my accent. I live just a 10 minute drive from where the Wargam Dragon Data Factory used to be. I'm looking forward to sharing more with you on this special edition of Coco Talk. Thank you. Hi, Tim Gilbert here. Going to be on Coco Talk Live with the Dragon Takeover event. And hopefully we'll find out some of the things in this red folder that indicate why. And we live less than 30 miles from where the Dragon 32 was produced. And it was the third computer I bought, probably after the ZX81 and the Spectrum. The premier producer of adventure writing systems like the Quill, Adventure Writer as it was in the US, and quite a few adventure games on other platforms, didn't publish it for the Dragon. Hi, this is Per Serrat, known for converting the Hobbit, modifying the DOS Plus for the Coco SDC and Dragon, porting the Infocom Adventures engine for the Dragon, and porting the AGD engine to the 6809 computers, some 219 games. Hi. I'm Nigel Barnes and I develop for Main. Uh, I usually specialise in emulating Acorn machines, but also anything 8-bit from the UK, which obviously includes the Dragon machines. Hello, my name is Henry, and I just traded this Coco for this Dragon. Hello, I'm Stuart Orchard, and back in the day I wrote a couple of games for the Dragon Micro. Hi, I'm Richard and I'm into preserving Dragon data and I'll catch you on the Dragon Special. Hi, this is Roberto Fernandez and I'm known for software preservation and tools. Hi there, I'm Simon. I, my first computer was a Dragon 32. Uh, as a result, I enjoy Dragon 32, mostly gaming and uh, food dabbled a bit in basic programming. Um, well, thank you for allowing me onto this discussion and look forward to meeting you all.
Can you believe I got this framed? Uh, that's uh, that's how much of. Uh, okay, looks like you guys just said that the Glenn Dahlgren output was muted, so we'll run that one again. Thanks for letting me know, John Vela. Let's try that again because that's we do want people to know about that. And that's the last promo, and then we're gonna get right back to the show. But we got a lot coming up in the future. I want to make sure we get all that out there. So real quick, take two. This is the Glenn Dahlgren uh, promo spot. Hi, my name is Glenn Dahlgren. You may know me from a few things that I've done in my past. Um, let's see if we can figure it out. Maybe it's the uh, PC games that I've done, like Unreal 2 or Wheel of Time. Uh, but maybe not. Uh, it might be because of the books that I've written, Child of Chaos. I have another one coming up called Game of War. Uh, and that's going to be released very shortly. But it's probably not that. I think I know what you might know me from. And that is... Oh, my Coco games. Um, because I ran Sundog Systems um, for a while in the heyday of the Coco. Can you believe I got this framed? Uh, that's, uh, that's how much of uh, a, an important piece of my life Sundog Systems was. Um, and I'm going to be on Coco Talk uh, on Saturday, August 28th from 11 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time or 2 p.m. Eastern. So feel free to come and chat, ask me anything you want, or tell me anything you want about the games that I made, and I'm, or, uh, or anything. I will see you then. All right, and that's why I had to uh, superimpose the corrected time, because Glenn remembered the time we were on last year. We're, in a, we're an hour sooner this year. So yes, so Glenn will be on on the 28th, and we start, we start at 1 p.m. Florida time now instead of 2. So uh, there's, there's our promos. A lot of stuff going on. We, I don't, I don't want to have another promo, but the week after the Dragon Special, we're having an interview with Stuart Orchard, who very humbly said, yeah, I made a few games for the Dragon back in the day, but yeah, he's made some pretty amazing games, and his current project is freaking fantastic. So, so we're going to have him on on the 21st, an interview with Stuart Orchard, whose current project is called Return of the Beast which is a very cool kind of Time Pilot 84 style um, shooter. Some uh, amazing music for a Coco 1 and two some, yeah, some, uh, some Amiga Sid style um, title music. So, uh, I love that Amiga Sid. That's my favorite sound check. Uh, the Amiga Sid, yeah, the Commodore 64 Sid, the Amiga Sid, whatever Sid you want. You know, you pick your, <laughs> you pick your Sid. Thank you there. Um, and so let's real quick say hi to who's out there in the live chat. So Kevin Holloway has been out there. Sixy, Karen, author of X-Roar. Curtis Boyle, Tom Eric Gunderson, Jim Rye. And uh, Alexander Wallace from Mexico and Mike Miller, David Craker, Atari Leaf is out there, Ken Reichard, Mark Overholzer, and uh, L. Curtis Boyle, and David Lord is out there, James Jones out there, Mike Miller, John Vela, who we just missed you before because we mentioned you in our new to Discord segment. John, thank you for being here. Atari Leaf, Mark Overholzer, Ken Reichard. You guys are out there. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you. So, Atari Leaf, we have to get you on for an interview sometime. Yes, please. Atari Leaf, you are an international phenomenon, a celebrity, a legend in our own minds. Love to have you on the show at some point in time. Um, we do have some project updates and acquisitions. Uh, why don't we start off with Rick Eulen, who said he had a little something, something to share, and then we'll get into some of the other um, announcements and, and things, too. Is that okay, Rick? You mind going uh, first? Sure. Sure. Um, first, thanks to I'm working on that uh, OSK box back there, and I found this thing, which is a 40 IDE pin IDE to SATA. to SATA. Can okay. So here's my cool new IDE drive for my. Oh, OSK you took box. an you took an <laughs> an SSD that you're now turning into a 40 pin IDE. That yeah, is so nice. So that should be fun. <laughs> and then uh, let's see. I guess is I that could, distorting the hobby? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> or do you need to share screen? So I need to stop yeah, sharing me, so you can. Let me throw it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Real quick. Feel free. Okay. So let's share. And I think I can just blank switch desktops on you. There we go. Okay. And then um, I'm in writing software for that Cocoa IO thing. So here is a web browser running on a Cocoa. Wait a second. If you're reading this page, you've probably got some sort of web browser running on your Cocoa. We hope it is 
at Coco.io, but all users are welcome. Oh, wow, look at that. And it's uh, in the process of downloading this page. It's identified the download links and other page links on it, so we're ready to go there. Unfortunately, I created a bug trying to get the download links working, so that broke. You introduced a feature. Um, exactly. <laughs> and that broke everything. Is, is this in um, Basic 09? It is. It's also got bookmarks. Wow. So, unfortunately, I've only written one page, so there's not much to bookmark just yet. <laughs> but uh, it's coming along. I pretty much need to convert this the line by line parser into not being basic 09 to get enough reasonable, you know, to get reasonable speed out of it. But hey, it's uh, it can waddle yep. through HTML 1.1 somewhat and ignore what it doesn't understand. So you can take your style sheets and toss them. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we don't need no there. stinking style. Yeah. And basic 9 is <laughs> excellent for prototyping stuff like this. It's quick and dirty. You can get it done. Just to make sure stuff's working. And I, I wish I'd saved the. Uh, yeah, here's what it looked like a, about a month ago. So, getting better. Nice. Um, and uh, I guess I, I wish I'd saved the. Uh, what was I trying to say? I forgot. It's gone. So I'll just stop sharing. Well, tell people real quick. Remind those who don't know what is CocoNet and where what will CocoNet be? Okay. So this CocoIO thing is just uh, CocoIO. Uh, yes, CocoIO. Yes. It, it is a a. a, a Ethernet card for Coco that doesn't require a host computer or anything. Just plug it into your. It's un unfortunately not wireless, but. Uh, right. But, but uh, yeah, it's it's a ROM pack thing with a with a network port on top. <laughs> now, was it also going to have some type of serial too, or is it, it just going to be network? It's got serial. I. It kind of an impasse right now. Um, the serial. I thought it would be easy because it's 16550, which is the same serial port as I made back in 97. Unfortunately, the new chip isn't sending out interrupts when it gets received data. And I don't have a dis I don't have the source, the original driver, so I can't figure out if it's a software problem or a hardware problem. Mm. I can see the chips receiving data. I can see it's not sending out an IRQ. It works on send. So the the twenty year old twenty five year old driver works just fine for sending, but not for receiving. So mm. I have got your driver, your last driver there, partially disassembled and comment. I haven't finished yet because I've been busy with a lot of other things, like the Dragon Fox special. But let me get back to that, and I'll send you the source, and maybe that. Well, and, sweet. Uh, oh. Yeah. So just real quick too, before we go on to a few more people, you just made me think of something. I was having um, lunch the other day with some guys in my Florida Retro Club, and one of the uh, Apple enthusiasts there was asking about. Coco networking because apparently there were Apple based network. You know, Apple had something like a token ring network even on the Apple IIs, and so there were some period correct networking applications on the Apple. Was there ever Coco network applications that ran over an actual sort of pseudo Ethernet type network, or was it mostly just the the kind of Telnet serial? OS nine Cere is what I remember. There was a K9Q which actually featured Telnet, FTP, Mail, and a bunch of other things, but it was running slip protocol on a modem. Basically, mm. right. there's the the problem with the Wiznet chip. It changes your internet into just a serial stream. Unfortunately, it's not a FIFO. It's it's a certain size buffer, and you have to manually wrap starting and ending addresses as you run past the end of the buffer and start over from the beginning. Mm. So there's there's room for some middleware there, um, but it leaves space for, for instance, using, you know, serial download protocols to download files. I'm hoping to use SCRZ to, to download Zmodem by just, you know, managing what I feed that. Um, so it has room to room to grow, I think. Um, let's see, am I still on, I can share mode? Yeah, here's, you can the, still share. Yeah. here's the product itself. Okay. So we have a serial port, we have an ethernet port and uh, takes up eight bytes of I.O. space. So you could you could theoretically stick two of them in a cocoa and be really cheap. The idea being you could use the serial for drive wire. Right. And, and keep the four sockets that you have Ethernet for. Right. So if somebody, if somebody was using an RS-232 card already in a multipack, this would replace that slot and give you your same serial connectivity plus Ethernet. 
Exactly, and then you, the four slot, the four sockets that you have on Ethernet can, you know, the web browser needs one. Downloading the file, you need another one. When we're in a DNS, you need another one. So, you, know, you could you could run out of Ethernet really quick. Um, so anyway, that's that's where I'm at. Um, it's still moving forward. I've got a little bit of a hardware problem, but nothing that's fatal, I don't think. Okay. And so we got a comment from Mark Siegel, of course, worked for Tandy in the, on the Cocoa and stuff back in the day. And he mentions there was a token ring for OS9, but it was not brought to market. And that actually, we've seen the prototype of that at some of the, the Rainbow and Cocoa Fests there. I think, I can't remember who has I, it now, but uh, yeah. yeah. I have the worst digitization of that prototype you've ever seen from one of the old off the hawk days. Yeah, it was pretty funky. This is twin lead. So getting back to the, the question then too, is this, there really wasn't proper Cocoa networking, therefore weren't a lot of network centric applications or utilities that existed back in the original time span of the color computer. Is that fairly? No, accurate? just basically the, the slip based, you know, right. protocols. But, but we are now living in a time thanks to things like drive wire and these Wi-Fi modems and things like that, where we can now use the internet. And we are working on multi-user, multiplayer type stuff for the color computer. And I guess a current similar thing to that would be Boise's Gitara project, right? Where I'm not sure if it's exactly a network or if it's more of a... But the Gitara project does allow multiple Cocos to kind of be in a bus, a ring topology almost, right? Um, but I don't know if that's yeah, networking it's a, it's or... it's like token ring. Similar to token ring. So there is something coming on now with the Gitara project and then that game that uh, Jay Cyril and... Uh, Brett Gordon are working on that's going to be multiplayer Cocoa 3 game using drive wire or you know whatever as a, as the kind of conduit for that. So there's I guess there will be networking in the future, but there really wasn't true Cocoa networking in the past. Um, no, except for that prototype that Mark yeah, mentioned because that right. was at Microware and they did have drivers kind of done for from what I understand, but they never decided to bring it to market. So gotcha. And thanks for stopping by, Mark Siegel. Love to have you on sometime too if you'd like to come join yes. us. Yes. Um, okay, so thank you, uh, Rick, for sharing that. And then we also had uh, Bill and uh, Pedro who want to show some stuff off. Who would like to go first? Doesn't matter to me. Bill, go ahead. All right, Bill, because you are so polite, eh? Um, <laughs> well, go ahead and uh, we'll hear what you have to say. Okay, well, uh, as many of you know that I've been working with Curtis on Nitrous Night Ease of Use project for the last few years. And I've always had an issue with the way OS 9 was actually handling the graphic screens for external use like games and things like that. Mainly because when you actually map in a set of blocks your program actually has to go through the system probably about four system calls before you actually get your memory blocks mapped into your own process space. So I've been actually working for quite a while trying to find the best way to actually handle this. So I researched through a bunch of the old source code listings uh, for various games that are around. And one of them came to uh, my attention real quick. Uh, it was actually Kuyum Guy, uh, where it, Kevin Darling actually ported it to OS 9. And while well, Kuyum Guy, of course, is a Glenn Dal Dahlgren project uh, that he did for Sundog Systems, uh, whenever it was, I can't remember. 88 or 89, yep. 80, yeah. And uh, once Kevin actually did that port, I noticed between that game and the other games in OS 9 that it was actually doing double buffering on the screens. And I'm going, well, how is he doing that? So I actually went into the source code and I actually looked exactly what Kevin did to actually do it. And I found that he had an actual MMU manager that will actually localize your own process space to have full control over the MMU without interacting or interfering with OS 9 in any way. And the speed that it has is just phenomenal because you're actually changing the MMU within your process space live on the system without doing any system calls. So you can actually uh, 
a good way to actually do it here is uh, do I got a share screen here, Steve? Or you can you just look for the green button that says share screen. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just gonna come on, switch over. There we go. Is this coming through or not yet? Oh wait, starting. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, so what you see on the screen here is the actual main core of the MMU, our memory management system. Mm -hmm. It is one routine that actually will remap all eight of the 8K blocks in your process space live without touching OS 9 altogether. Because each process in OS 9 actually has its own process descriptor which contains what 64K memory blocks are allocated to that process space each. So basically what it, uh, Kevin did was he actually looked for the actual process descriptor for my, uh, the, your actual local process in memory and actually grab pointers to that dat image or MMU set of registers and modifies it live in the process descriptor without interacting with OS 9 altogether and OS 9 wouldn't even know that you changed the, the, the actual local process descriptor for its memory arrangement. So that will allow you to actually have full buffering systems on the screen. Uh, in Kevin's case in Kuyum Guy, he actually set up three graphic screens to do the different graphics in Kuyum Guy. But for my project that I have going on right now, it actually only uses two graphic screens uh, for the double buffering so that you can get rid of the video tearing when you're doing a lot of sprite updates on the screen. So basically, it actually localizes the memory management within your own process space that you don't actually have to do the system calls to OS 9 to actually do any of this mapping in and mapping out, which saves tremendous amount of time. So as you can see here, the entire routine for switching out the 64K task in your own process space is the right on the screen right now. The whole routine. Let me ask you a couple of uh, hopefully not too dumb questions, but to, to make this uh, an analogy to something that non-COCO people might be familiar with, is, would, would this be similar to like maybe be able to running an MS-DOS game on top of Windows 95, say? Because those games could way, write yes. directly to the hardware still? In a way, yes, because it's it's actually still directly writing to the hardware and also to your process descriptor at the same oh, okay. time. Okay, so it's so it literally is a hybrid. Then it's not like running. Yeah, a, it's a hybrid okay. where it's actually doing both at the same time. So it updates the process descriptor, then it updates the hardware to the MMU that you want, so that OS nine itself will not know that you actually did any changes. It just sees that process descriptor and says, "Oh." these were the memory banks it gets okay that's what it gets and it does the rest yep. but you're changing those on the fly so i mean if you want to map in a screen really quick because normally you have to go through a bunch of system calls which has like software interrupt overhead and a whole bunch of other crap yes. slows it down usually on like a mapping one 8k block actually goes to the system probably four times before you actually get that process or that 8k memory block into your actual process space mm. So, so they've always found that when I was actually doing any sort of mapping a block using the OS 9 system calls, I would actually have to sleep for a couple of ticks before the process descriptor actually got updated. Whereas this way, it's immediate. You don't touch OS 9 whatsoever. You're basically... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. The bouncing ball demo that's on Ease of Use, the one that Kevin Darling wrote with the Mona Lisa picture up in the corner, yeah. that actually does have a sleep of, of two ticks, so basically one-thirtieth of a second to let the the mapping settle because, as Bill said, it goes through multiple things 
you know, to get all that stuff mapped the legal way, quote unquote. And so that actually has a slip because if you take that sleep tick out, it actually does tear a little bit. You'll see, you'll see it kind of shifts and it kind of catches it mid mid switch type thing. So this would eliminate all of that. You could actually run a full 60 frame per second game with, with no tearing at all. Yes. So the exactly. upside seems obvious when you can when you can write direct to hardware. This is like getting into the benefits of RS DOS, right? When you do it in RS DOS, you could write direct to hardware. Back in the days of MS DOS, the MS DOS games could write direct to hardware. They didn't have to go through Windows and drivers and all that kind of stuff. So the upside when you write direct to hardware is obviously speed performance. What's the downside when when you say things like Nitrous Nine has no idea what you're doing? Can you possibly contaminate something it might want to use for something else because it didn't know you were you know playing in this particular sandbox that it might want to access later on no and the reason why that is is because this little routine only changes the the actual memory manager which is the actual eight ak banks that get mapped into a process space so it actually does that directly on its own and does the change without interacting with OS 9. But OS 9 will still know what you did. OS 9 actually... knows basically what pages in memory you're blasting graphics to. Yeah. Yes. And basically, if you're looking at the code here, you'll see there's two loops. You'll see deck B is kind of where the loop counters are. So the first one, um, I'm not sure which one's which here, but okay. basically what it does is it'll copy the MMU, the 8K block map directly to the gimme itself. So that makes the immediate change. Yeah, and then it goes into the process. That's actually descriptor. the second part. Okay, uh, the first and, the, part and the process is descriptor the... does the one where it updates for OS nine to know what's going on. So that when task switching happens, it's actually got the new map ready to go too. So yeah. it doesn't interfere with OS 9's multitasking. Also, the advantage of doing this is we get the speed of a deck, this basic program, but multitasking still works perfectly fine. Yes, and also uh, with this memory manager as well, uh, you can actually still use everything from os9 for system calls like uh, disk io serial disk io mouse pointers all that kind of stuff mouse right? pointers graphic i level menu handlers drop right. down menus all, all the fonts everything that are built for os9 already all can be reused is this the new... does this require a source code to be changed and things to be recompiled or is this and to really take advantage this is, of this? It's, its own memory manager localized to your own process so basically, OS 9 will have its little memory manager unit going to handle all the different processes, all the different hardware, so on and so forth. Whereas this only modifies your own local process space. So you're actually only dealing with your own information versus uh, modifying anything else in OS 9. But I think what Steve's asking, this this would have to be implemented for each program you want to run this way. This yes. wouldn't be one generic routine that gets this called isn't, by everything. This isn't like what you're doing, Curtis, to optimize the graph libs and things that speed up everything automatically. This is... Uh, this, this is a bit more specialized, yeah. It would yeah, be yeah. for high-speed games or it's something you really want to access the screen or something else. It doesn't right, so let's pick pick a game that you already have in there. Let's just say Thexter, which I know Thexter is already fast. And uh, But w w if I wanted to take this concept and speed something up that's already in the ease-of-use project, do I have to recompile something to make this work? Or You'd, you'd basically I... insert this routine and then and, and, and replace any select uh, escape code sequence would basically select a window to display. And when you, you say when you say instead. you well, you're uh, you're not saying me because I would never actually do that but yeah but <laughs> well, yeah, somewhat yeah, yeah. but this is not you're not going to go through and re-optimize and recompile what's already on the distribution I'm taking in right yeah, no, so this would be specialized. I mean, basically, the games right now that do do direct screen writes that use the legal calls like Dexter, like Shanghai Flight Sim Two, etc. They do a legal quote unquote you know display call to tell to switch the next window. The bouncing ball demo is another one, but that one needs that extra sleep tick to make sure that all the back and forth from the operating system has been done before it displays the screen otherwise you get tearing so most of those are actually frame limited to 30 frames per second right now with this one here if you wanted to do a full 60 game go for it okay but but but, but basically this is almost like you have to write something from scratch to do this or recompile something yes. else yes this is not this is not like a changing it's a driver to make everything time. fast yeah, it's not built yeah. into OS. Gotcha. Okay, so you this is uh, have to do your own manipulation of the memory 
and also of the screens themselves. Okay. But th this might be something where somebody like, let's just say, theoretically, Nick Morentes, who would never do something for Nitrous 9, might say, well, if we can get you the direct hardware graphic speed and we got you another well, Ferrari, maybe would you do a Nitrous 9 something or another, right? So <laughs> well, here, here Nick yeah. goes. This little memory manager does it all. Right. Yeah, he okay. can even animate like, the trash can in, in, in retail. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a question. Yeah. Yep. How do you know as you switch it? I use the same routines on RS DOS. How do you know what's available, which 8K blocks are available that Nitrous OS 9 isn't using? What do you know when okay. it's available? OS 9 itself actually has uh, system calls where you can actually get the entire memory available on your currently running system. So, okay, so you go out and ask one it, system what's call will bring in the entire uh, OS9 memory map uh, block by block and actually tell you which ones are allocated and which ones aren't. Right, so then you pick out the number that you want and you tell yeah. OS9, I'm going to be using these off someplace all by myself. Yeah, there, there's yeah. a couple of ways to do that, George. I mean, one is with video, you just tell, you know, I want to assign a window or something, and then you right. just basically you get returned. We have a system call where you can say, hey, the, the four 8K blocks for your screen are over here, and then you can map them in using this technique. There's also the VRN driver has the ability for you to reserve blocks of up to nine MMU contiguous blocks, and you can open separate paths if you want more than one set of these, and you can allocate memory for, like, you know, sound samples or whatever else or graphics whatever else you can actually legally go through the uh operating system itself to say I, I need to reserve this much memory for this and this much memory for this which goes through os9 so os9 is fully aware of all the stuff and you would do that in the setup of a game like this right. okay I which so i actually you, have you, on you... screen right now rick uh this is actually where it loads up some of the graphics uh images when i hear it, i actually tell os9 i want one ak block it allocates the ram I save that block number and then I actually map it in to my actual process space, open a file that actually contains the graphic information, get the size of it, read it in to where I map it, close the file and away it goes. You carry on for whatever else you want. And then in, like on the next routine where I actually, well, I load the one screen on our terrain buffer now i actually hold, load a title screen doing it the same way where i actually get the block number of the screen whichever screen buffer i'm going to either one or two get the actual screen mapped into memory open the file skip past any header information because in this particular case i'm using vef files read the entire title screen in, close the file. And I got to sleep in here just so I actually can see the title screen on the screen for a few seconds. <laughs> and that's, and basically for what it does right now. DOD, I'm wondering if this is going to yeah, be Dungeons you'll, you'll see what it's going to be. Is this the Department of Defense? <laughs> the Depart Department of Defense, is that what we're dealing with here? You're hacking the yeah. Pentagon again, aren't you, Bill? Damn it, Bill. Yeah. So basically, Depths of Diablo. Oh, I was thinking Dungeons of Daggerath, but okay, this is good too. <laughs> Depths of Diablo. Oh, yeah. look at that. Nice. So that basically you can see how fast it actually goes between the, the screens. Yeah, look at that. Beautiful. Did you, did you want to sneak peek some of the graphics, like view a VF or, uh, something, that or not yet? I can do, yes. Uh, these are actually some of the graphic tiles that I have built so far already. Well, I've seen now, some a lot weird of them contamination. Stole, we're not seeing, we're not we're seeing it. Cross hatches right oh. now. Oh, I might need to share oh, the screen I, versus yes, an app. I, I shared the app, not the screen. Here, we will just switch over to this one. <laughs> Ooh! Holy crap! You got a lot of tiles. Uh, and they're <laughs> yep. and, and they're that's just they are start. colorful too. They're very colorful tiles. Yeah. Now, this particular image I actually uh, took from Ultima 5 on the PC, which actually uh, had the perfect tile size of what I wanted, 
plus it had a lot of the colorful images because most of the actual uh, sprite games that I've seen in Nitrous 9 for uh, things like that, they were always like a one color or two color sprite. This particular uh, system actually has four colors per sprite. Very nice. You can actually get very, uh, a lot of different things in there already. That sure puts my hand-drawn graphics for my game to shame, boy. Well, I still <laughs> actually do the actual conversion because, uh, like, I haven't actually found a, an image editor on a PC or, or Linux or anything like that that has less than 256 colors nowadays. So everything is 256 colors or up to 32 bit color nowadays and i just was ah that's too complicated to do all the right. or convert all that so i just said i just gonna find what i want for image wise then i actually hand code it uh using my own tile editor which i'll switch back to we can see your vcc if you want to just run it from this screen oh is it there yeah it was yeah. There. okay because I thought I just shared the app. Did you just hit clear there and open up another terminal? You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> See, he well, could be playing the game and still do this. Look at tile the tile editor. So I wrote a little tile editor uh, that I can actually. Uh, let's just load up one of them. Ah, look like at that's that. That's one of the images there. That's nice, Bill. So it gives you the original view, the uh, current view. So if you change anything in this window right now, it'll actually update the current, but leave the original alone. So if you want to back out of what any, whatever you're changing, you can. Uh, now this file uh, or this program I actually wrote so that it will actually handle anywhere from a two by two sprite all the way up to a 24 by 24 uh, pixel sprite with these with 16, 16 colors. colors. Nice. That's nice, Bill. And of course, I have uh, built into my color set already. Uh, a palette zero is strictly for uh, transparency. Yeah. So it the future, future of OS 9 graphical gaming is bright. Getting there. Oh, and of VCC course, has stopped working. That's yeah, yeah, I get that occasionally. Too. That's because you're running the Windows virus. So, um, oh yes, I. The only reason why I use VCC is for so because I can crank the CPU speed up to maximum and I can assemble yeah. them real quickly. <laughs> <laughs> this looks really good, Bill. Yes. This looks cool. Yeah, I've just I just got well, the latest. I, uh, the actual game design itself that I'm working on uh, is kind of based on the original uh, Diablo series from Blizzard Ent Entertainment on the PC. Okay. Uh, I'm actually converting it into a Coco 3 style. Uh, doing, it has all the same things and all the same images and everything. Because I actually happened to have that the package there. Yeah, which is uh, the whole manual for Diablo 2, which gives you all the character properties, all the actual objects, all the quests, everything from the actual original. The Diablo strategy 2. guide, a.k.a. cheat book. Yes. <laughs> yes, which were most of these games were unplayable without the cheat book because. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Diablo that was, was the one where you always could finish it without yeah just that you, this gave you all the little secrets of where yeah things all the were. all the bonus pick yeah i'm a big fan i love to play a game where you kind of just discover and you learn you learn by accident where i don't like a game where you need the book to finish it but i would use the book when i got stuck or like when my wife was playing final fantasy she literally had the book on her lap and she had to play the game by the book and flip pages and i'm like to me that's not playing a game that's following a book you know so but yeah those strategy guys are so i was a racket man it was a whole racket. You couldn't finish certain games without them. Uh, all right, there we go. Yeah, the, I have this running on uh, Cocoa Pie right now, the latest ease of use with hardware real-time clock emulated. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. And I noticed, like you say, you're overclocking your VCC, so that booted up pretty quick, yeah? Yeah. yeah you know, that, the only reason why I do that is just for development, mm -hmm. uh, for assembling 
programs because on a real Coco, it's kind of slow because ASM goes through its little thing and of course it's not that great for speed but with VCC and cranking up the CPU speed I can get a reasonable workable environment <laughs> right yeah for smaller projects it's fine doing it just natively even on the Coco I do some of smaller things on there too especially with the Gimme X because that boosts it up a little bit but yeah this is this is like running LW ASM basically in another window and then copying it over type thing it runs this quick and yeah. since Bill and I are both like old dogs, no new tricks type thing, we're just used to the way the old assembler works. I'm used to the old assembler uh, just because I know all its little quirks and all its right. little tricks. And uh, like LWASM, in order to get it all up and running, which I do have, uh, but I just find it too much of a pain to get it from LWASM final build back onto an OS9 disk, back onto a Coco. Whereas this is just boom, it's there, and right. away I go. Right, you're dealing with the source. You're dealing with yeah. the destination, I should say. Actually, you're working on the on the destination. So yeah, yeah. So cool stuff. Getting back to the actual MMU core, uh, it basically is split up so that you act, your very first 8K block in your process space is your actual data area, which is common to all your memory mappings. The very top uh, 8K of your program is the actual core itself and then all of the blocks in between you can modify and change to whatever you want it can be either code it can be data it can be uh anything graphics sound samples screen sound samples uh all kinds of different things so do, what what you're showing off here is a revelation to Nitrous Nine, but is it is literally is this what people who are writing stuff for RS DOS are already doing? In most cases, yes, because of that double buffering system that they, they can do in RS DOS quickly. But they've where, all they all kind of had to invent their own respective wheels, where you now have a common set of wheels for anybody in Nitrous yeah, Nine the, to use. The the biggest yes. advantage of doing it this way, and of course this is going to pump out Nitrous Nine because that's what we do. Um, is that basically like, you know, Nick, sometimes, you know, you want to make something work uh, for, say, saving high scores or loading data files or something like that. Well, you, if you're doing it in RS-DOS, most of the time you got to worry about trying to fit it on a floppy disk sized image. Or, you know, it may not run on drive wire because you did direct calls to the disk controller or all these other various things. This Because Nitrous 9 has all that stuff abstracted, you don't have to write any of the code to handle disk stuff. You don't have to write any of the code to handle memory management. You don't have to do any of that stuff. It's all right there to just make a system call change a few registers you know on entry like an api call under windows and it just does all that stuff for you so the stuff that would be tedious and you have to write and make sure it's compatible with the drive wire and real hardware and a real hard drive and all that stuff you don't have to worry about any of that stuff that that's just all handled on by the os itself you can concentrate on the game you don't have to concentrate on those other crap I can hear Nick Marty saying, but what's the fun in that? <laughs> <laughs> well, but you can write a web browser in basic. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Rick, Rick kind of proved the point, too. So All yeah. right. Nick's just wrong. This is space facts. No, nah, <laughs> listen. <laughs> 16 Ferraris and counting can't be all that wrong. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but Rick he could be having pudding. like... You could be having Lamborghinis if you did it this way, I think. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Hello, Protein Thread, and goodbye, Atari Leaf, in the live chat saying well, we got one coming, one going. What you got? <laughs> so I actually, in, in this particular case, too, I also have one secondary code page, uh, which is basically a loader module, which will load all the graphics and everything as a subroutine module. So basically, it links it in, finds out where that uh, program is stored in memory, maps that block in, the, executes it, comes out of it, clears the MMU, and goes back to your main engine core. And uh, this here gives you the memory layout when this program enters, which is the subroutine module. So the first block is my fixed data area. Block one is this module. The other six are blank. And the final Block 7 is the engine core itself, which is the MMU uh, core, and also it, I'm thinking of putting some of the graphics core for swapping the double buffering screens in, in that section as well. Cool stuff. 
Cool. Yeah. And I think uh, Pedro said he had to step away for a minute. I'm not sure how much more time did you have to show off here, Bill? Are you still going? Uh, no, you... I'm pretty much uh, okay. done now. Uh, just because I want, basically wanted to show the beginnings of what I have uh, and what I've actually found out with this memory manager, what it's capable of and how powerful it is. So in and the how simple it is. That, that was a genius of Kevin right. Darling. I mean, that oh, guy yes. knew nitrous, uh, he knew OS9 better than either of us, to be honest. And then uh, so, when, I, when I looked at that code, I'm going, God damn. Excuse the French, but God damn it, Jesus! <laughs> Les <laughs> Les Um Yeah. So, um, so in the weeks to come, will you have some little eye candy things to show us? Here's how wicked fast it is and stuff. Some yes. Some I'm hoping actually. Well, I'm whiz gonna, bang uh, demos. Let the dragon special go uh, for the next couple. What is it? Three weeks. We have about three weeks of three weeks uh, of interviews. Yeah. Three yeah, weeks uh, of so superb content. Enough. <laughs> uh, that will give me enough time to actually get uh, the actual graphics core in place for uh, printing fonts and some of the core sprite routines. Uh, now, I notice you have the GIMP on your desktop there, and Karen was saying that this is one of those GNU utilities that should let you change your bit depth pretty easily, so I'm not sure how... Uh, it doesn't allow you to go ba uh, below, below 56. Oh, okay, so you can't get it to like 6-bit color. No. Okay. Otherwise, I would love GIMP because it is okay. a great program. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Well, that's cool. That's exciting that um, that we'll see something like that in the near future. Uh, some, you know, Nitrous Nine just keeps getting betterer all the time. So that's cool stuff. And um, yeah, for those who are wondering about the next version of EOU, it is going to be a bit later because I mean, Bill and I both have these side game projects because we want to push Nitrous Nine limits and see what other improvements we should put in the operating system itself for this kind of thing. So be patient. And taking a break from Nitrous Nine and getting on to some more fun stuff. Right, right, right. Uh, cool, 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 cool. Well, we have another announcement slash update from uh, Pedro. Hello, Pedro. Hello, everybody. You guys hear me? Yes, sir. Excellent. So I actually don't know where to start, but um, I guess I'll just start with uh, a while back, not that long ago, I, I did a Coco 2 board, a uh, way to give back, uh, you know, to the Coco that got me, you know, started in tech. Um, you know, it, it, it was very, very, very influential. So I still feel like I got to give back. And so I'm reacquainting myself with the Coco. And so went out and I did a Coco 2 port and I liked it. It worked, you know, I was excited. Um, and, but as I'm learning more and, you know, I'm more and more in the community, I see that, you know, what people really want to see a lot is a Coco 3. I said, well, you know, I want to, I want to get a Coco 3. I want to get one, but man, they're so expensive. So I've been trying for several months to buy one, but you gotta like sell a kidney or something, to, you know, get one of these Cocos. And so I was like, well, maybe it's, I, I know I want to make a Coco 3 board and maybe, Maybe I just make one, you know, and then figure out how to get a gimme later on, you know. So I started doing that, and uh, and then I I, I actually um, thought, well, I got to figure out how to get a gimme, and I traded uh, a, a, an HDMI board, you know, the you know the RGB to HDMI project. Right, 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 right. Uh, with C, you know C Duris, you know Chris Duris on Coco Discord, you know, for his gimme. Uh, he had a gimme when I ran our trail. I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to happen. I'm going to make the Coco 3, hopefully, you know, and I can, whatever. But, but then shortly after, I was able to buy a, a spare parts Coco 3 that somebody was selling on eBay. Um, and then I bought that, and, and it was an easy repair. Thank God. It was a, it was just the salt chip uh, needed to be replaced, you know, on And I had, you know, one of those boards that I had made, you know, to get it up and running. So then now it's like, well, great. Now I have a reference board, you know, that I can, that I can use to start, you know, making it. And so... I want to share my screen here. Can I start sharing? Yeah. Is there any way you can get your volume to come up a little bit too? Because you're, you're, I don't know if you can get closer to your microphone or not, but you're coming in a little bit low. Okay. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can do that here. But yeah, you should be able to share. Is that better? Not really. No, oh. both the same. It's about the same. <laughs> yeah. We can hear you there. Everybody just, just tune your ears in. I'll Good. speak louder. All right. Okay, so um, 
Let me share my entire entire desktop here. Okay. Yes. You guys see it? Okay, good. And so I said, well, you know, I, I sort of had a roadmap already. Um, and I said, I did the Coco 2, so I'm just going to take the Coco 2 schematic. And, I'll, you know, I'll show you that. And this is kind of when I came up. And I based it, you know, off of, uh, you know, this schematic, which, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. Very helpful, very clean. You know, whoever, whoever did this, Sapco, I think is the same. And also, also, I used you know the the one at the out of the service manual, and so I took the Coco two schematic that I had done, and luckily it was the Coco two and Coco three are very similar in terms of you know how everything is connected. You know, obviously the gimme is uh, or the big difference is, and so I just went in and uh, started rewiring the schematic I already had, and so uh, the big changes were you know where the the SAM where I had the SAM chip, now there's a gimme. You know, here's the, uh, you know, the symbol for the gimme chip that I drew up. Um, and then sort of, I, I sort of started organizing in little subsections I thought made sense. And, you know, I don't know if it makes sense completely, but, you know, this is sort of how I structured it. Uh, and then uh, I said, well, you know, now I need to make a board um, and I want to follow, you know, what I did with Coco 2. So I'm going to try and make a duplicate board, a drop-in replacement. And then so, you know, the, the initial reason why I did the Coco 2 and the same for the Coco 3 uh, was to contribute to the Bit Preserve project that was started by the bald engineer, uh, James Lewis. And so he, he's done a great job. Uh, he's put this project out there for people to contribute and, you know, uh, transcribe these old schematics to a usable form, you know, in an open source EDA platform so that you know preserve it for future use and to do things with it and so that was my initial uh sort of you know uh, why i wanted to do it uh so then uh, i was like well he asked the question and said well how do you confirm that the schematic is actually good and so i thought well i guess the best way to do it is to actually make a board Okay, and so I did that with the Coco 2, made the board and confirmed that that schematic uh, was good. So I was like, well, I'm going to follow this roadmap and do that with the Coco 3. And so I've done quite a bit, actually. And here I'll show what I have so far. I'll bring up the PCB view here. And so I actually have a um, board here uh, that I've drawn up. And uh, I'm going to move this out of the here. Let me turn off the copper layers here so you can see. The Are we looking at the top or the bottom of it right now? This is the top of the board. Okay, so the gimme is not in the same spot, but it, I guess theoretically it doesn't matter. It's it's more or less in the same spot. Is um, it? Yeah. So it, I'll, actually, I'll show you what I did. And so I took uh, uh, an image of the board layout uh, mm -hmm. from the manual, and uh, actually I printed it out, straightened it out, and then scanned it back in. And then I brought it into the program, and so oh, okay. this stuff is generally in the same place, not the exact same no, place. No, I don't know why, but I thought the gimme was up more towards the center right side of the stuff, but I haven't looked at a Coco 3 in a while. I do see the kind of l shape area where the memory uh, expansion board would go, so that looks like that's in a fairly um, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping consistent it's place. Yeah. I'm hoping it's close. I mean, I you know, I have my uh, measuring, you know, and, and doing stuff like here. Now, here, here, this would be kind of interesting because for the people who have to do the 512 and 2 meg upgrades, they've got to clip a capacitor to do that. If you could make that a jumper exactly. where they good. wouldn't have to clip it, that would be probably helpful. And, you know, and I didn't know you had to clip uh, capacitors until the other day when I actually I ordered a triad board uh, to do the 512 memory upgrade. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to upgrade the Coco that I have, the Coco 3, but at the same time, I'm going to use it to measure uh, before I order the board to make sure, you know, uh, he's right, in right, place. right. And so when I saw, uh, when I read, you know, the upgrade procedure about clipping the capacitors, I was like, ah, I'll just, you know, there's a there's a jumper that you just don't solder, you know, if, once you get the board or, or maybe you cut the jumper because you can, you, you can, you have it made with those jumpers actually, you know, um, open or closed and you can solder or cut them, whatever, and then re solder them later. But I haven't decided how I'm going to do that part yet. But, and you'll have stuff like the CPU socketed too, right? And so, yeah. So here, let me, let me show yeah, you the Yeah, having the CPU with like a through hole socket versus the soldered CPU would help for uh, people who want to do a 6309 instead of a 6809. Well, with no I'm soldering, soldering requirement. Socketing everything. 
You're socketing everything. And, and as soon as yeah, socket sock it to me. Yeah, sock it to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, my computer's a little slow right now. Oh, that's cool. We should see a 3D. Something is okay. Character. Yeah, it's it, there. We go. Oh, look at that. Woohoo! Motherboard so, porn. Look at this. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> porn for Coco Greeks. That is awesome, dude. So you know, I it, it didn't take much effort to get it to render this, um, and I think it's worth it because uh, it really lets you see, you know, how it's going to look and how things are. Our, our space now is that is that empty space there? Is that where the RF modulator goes? Because that's a complete waste of time in my opinion. <laughs> that is the RF can. That's sure. where it goes. And and like I said uh, initially, uh, like I said, my initial goal is to contribute to the Bit for Serve project. So I, I felt that I should keep that there. And, and besides, I don't even have a working board yet. I don't know what's going to work. Uh huh. Uh, you know, I got to troubleshoot it. So I want to make it as close as possible, you know, to the original, so that I can use the service manual to troubleshoot and get it to work. Right. But once that's done, you know, I agree, waste of space, you know, all sorts of cool stuff can go there. That's just, that's real estate that needs to be used for something else. We have to get Ed Snyder to send you a Gimme X at some point uh, for testing on this too. Yeah, that, that would be fantastic. I would love to. I mean, and, and again, this is open source. And if he wants it, he can get it. You know, I'm not, you know, if he wants to mess with it too. But, uh, and, and if he sends me a Gimme X, fantastic. I would love to play with one. And that's another uh you know, some might be asking, well, why are you doing this? These things don't break on that much, right? I guess. I don't know. But um, I guess if people upgrade the Gimme X's, you're going to have all these, uh, you know, this and Coco Gimme's yeah. lying around. Yeah, hand me down. And there's going to become a secondary market for, for hand me down Gimme chips, right? So, yeah. um, no, Coco 3 has a salt chip too, doesn't it? It has a salt yep. chip, it does. And, now, and have that, you thought about replacing that because of the availability? Yeah, he's been designing one. We've been showing his videos for a while. So I, I call it the pepper board, and it completely, from all the testing I've done, it completely replaces the, the salt chip. It does the, um, it does the voltage regulation. It does the uh, RS-232 communications. And it's, it, it can plug in, but it, you know, in, the, in the next revision of the board, you don't even need a socket for the salt chip. You know, this circuitry could just be you know, put in there. There really isn't much to it. Um, it yeah, was, um, Karen was asking from the Dragon perspective, what's the project for the motherboard preservations? What's that called again? Bit Preserve. Bit Preserve, Karen. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Bit mm. Preserve. Uh, let me see. Well, I can I can put it in the chat in a little bit. No, that's cool. That's cool because um, and here's the thing: if some so people are saying. Um, how could I upgrade my Coco 2 to a Coco 3? Because the case is pretty much the same, right? The, uh, well, the... no, or it depends. Uh, so there are a bunch of different types of Coco 2s. And, uh, I have one. Um, the, actually, the one that I, the board that I made is larger than this one, considerably larger. Um, and, and so it won't fit. And I do have another Coco. Um, it is the, um, it was the one that has the, the two uh, DRAM chips instead of the eight. Uh, I forget what model it is, but it's closer in size, but still not the same. So, but what is possible if uh, this works is that um, we can take the board design and just, you know, change the board layout, you know, with the same components, same circuit. Right, 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 right. No Coco 2, right? And then you have a Coco 2 case with the Coco 3 on the inside. But then, you know, like, well, really, you know, I'm, I'm sure some people will be like, oh, hey, you still need some case mods like the composite ports. Or just, there isn't that on the Coco 2. And right. Exactly. Well, the RGB connector do, in the bottom, etc. The RGB connector couldn't be moved. Another thing that can yeah. be done, for example, is, uh, and I was thinking, if you have, um, if, if you're okay with it, um, you can remove the, you know, the, the ports over here, you know, the joystick ports and the IO port, and all these ports back here, and have them come out uh, just uh, one high density DIN connector out to a bo another board, right? Right. That would free up space. That breaks these out again. Right. And even like where the RF can is too have a high density output there and look a little mini din that would come out of that single or that uh, coaxial connection was that hole's already kind of drilled you just make a little mini din that goes in there and have that break out into other things yeah like so audio cool. video things like that yeah things like that can be done and then that yeah. just opens up the space to put in like uh, uh you know other things maybe even a you know since it's open source as well maybe even a you know a built-in i don't know if it makes sense for coco free but like uh an HDMI, you know, RGB to HDMI circuitry. Sure. You, know, you pop in a Raspberry Pi and then you have HDMI out and stuff like that. So things can be done. 
Um, Would that so, include a real time clock and a um, right. on light? So, uh, you know, I, I don't know how, you know, I think I asked Curtis one time, uh, you know, if it was a real thing, if people did want an RTC, or is that like a running joke, or is it both, or whatever? A little bit of both. I, I think yeah. there is a potential for it. And, you know, I, and maybe this is being used already. I just don't know. I'm relatively new to the community. But if I, if I show you the schematic here, okay. And if we go, you know, to, uh, let me see. Yeah, the Gimme, for example, right? You got a, you got a, a DMUX here, right? You got three select lines coming out of the Gimme, right? And you got four unused lines that can be potentially used to select another device. I don't know how easy it is to use those select lines on the Gimme or it's impossible. Um, but I mean, that's a waste in my opinion. Was it, you know, did, was there a plan to ever, you know, have stuff connected on here that you could address? And also on, uh, let me see, on one of the PIAs, I think it's IC4. Yeah, on the, on, the, uh, on this one, you have four unused lines on the uh, 6821, you know, and that, that's, that can be used as well for stuff. So I, I think there's a little bit of room in there to add things like that. You know, one way or another. Um, so maybe that could be done with another hmm. uh, revision of this. Now, I know, I know this first generation is designed to be drop-in replacement, but would, would a future one maybe be able to support like a low-voltage USB-powered power supply or something like that too to simplify uh, connectivity and uh, everything else? Or I think USB-C would can power this because uh, I, don't, I don't think it draws more uh, than two amps. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think USB-C can... Uh, power two amps maybe when you plug things in uh, i've never used an mpi maybe I don't know because that would free up some space too where the power supply is at too if you if you could get rid of that old transformer and replace that yeah. with something modern that would free up space inside the case for something else yeah absolutely absolutely or if you don't want your old four four three case, let's say you can redesign the board to fit, you know, like a, an, an ATX style. Right, right. Which is kind of what Ed Snyder did with his first uh, kind of Coco Two clone. It was just a square motherboard. It was not yeah. meant to match or fit anything, but it was just minimal PCB space to get it all in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, there's there lots of options. And this is compelling because, you know, there's the people who like things like the Mister or an FPGA or something else. But this is now real hardware. And the, and the, and the few things that were, no, were not previously available, like the Salt Chip and the Gimme, well, you're, we have modern versions of that. So the fact that we could make a brand new, pretty much real hardware Coco with maybe a few FPGA pieces... Um, but still using a 6809 or 6309 and all these things, that's kind of interesting to people who are a little bit more hardware purists. Um, well, that, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. I think now we have the potential to make a new Coco, to add a Coco uh, to the world because, you know, the salt chip, you know, it can be replaced with something like, you know, the board that I made. It, right. Yes, the only chip on here right now that I see that um, can be made, and I, and I showed in a video that, you know, you can do it thanks, you know, Karen helped me out. Uh, he told me about the R2R ladder, you know, to make the sound on the dragon, you know, is the Simpson 526 chip, right, which is the DAC. And I think that can be easily, I think it's also low-hanging fruit like the salt chip. That can be re-implemented because the, the two PIAs are still available. They, there are modern replacements that you can buy. Okay. You know, and then so you have the Gimme X. Right. Know, with the Gimme X and, and everything else you can still buy. Right, right. Um, so, you know, that's exciting. That, you know, that's cool. Right. Yeah, so this is really serving two purposes. I mean, one, you'll have the, the standard Coco 3 replacement board. So people have a damaged board or just don't want to pay three, four hundred dollars for an eBay Coco 3. They have that. They will have that option. And then you can tweak the design for other cases and then start adding extra features, extra hardware, uh, like, you know, gimme X's or uh, sound chips or whatever else you want to do. Throw in a 6502 and a ZX. Well, let's not downgrade it here. Come on. Z80 um, and... Uh... <laughs> Or you have a broken Commodore, you just put, put <laughs> the SID chip in there. Pull, pull one of those SID chips out of the Amiga, right? And put that in there. So. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> There's no SID chip in an Amiga. Yeah, I know. I screwed up earlier. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that's the joke. A, that's a callback. Yeah. Um, you got to stay awake, Nick, during the show. You've been caught up on that, too. <laughs> Uh, that's cool, Pedro. You're doing some amazing stuff, my friend. You're doing the Lord's work when it comes to what the Thank Coco you. community needs. 
actually right now I'm not doing any developing other than the salt chip. I'm just doing some transcribing. You know, I, the fun comes later when, you know, this is, you know, available to actually develop with, I think. Yeah. My, my perspective. Um, and then I did, I did want to show one more thing. I'm sorry. I won't That's okay. Go ahead. Um, so actually a couple more things. I don't know where I put that. So, to, you know, to size it, um, am I still sharing? No. Yeah, you are. We yeah, see, are. we see your side by side. Okay. Okay. So I just wanted to show, this is the rendition next to a picture of the actual board. You know, it's, it's close. It's pretty close. Yeah. And I, yesterday I was like, well, yeah, I want to see how much it would cost to get it with what I have. It's routed. I could order it by the way, but I want to wait till I get the, I want to measure that one last thing before I order it. So I got JLPCD code here and I got for, you know, for five boards, you know, it's not much. It's 2160 plus 25. The shipping is more than the five. Boards. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane, you know? man. So for under 50 bucks, I can get five boards. Wow. Know, so it's, it's amazing, you know. I think so. For the price of a hundred to hundred and fifty boards, you can get a Coco Three single on eBay, not even knowing yeah. it's working. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that's an unpopulated board, right? That is yeah, that's just the PCB. Board. Yeah, yeah, and there is work involved there, and and I have sourced the components. You know, I'm going to buy them and build it. You know, and that takes time and effort. But the other thing you can do, my, my next step, and I started doing that with Coco Two, is that I can replace all those um, those components with surface mouse components. All the passive components, I can just replace with surface mount and then I can just order it, you know, and I, uh, JLC PCB, uh, PCB offers, you know, an assembly service and they, you know, it's like $3 or something that's you know, per board, you know, it's super. So cool. that would be with all the sockets and, and capacitors and resistors already on? Well, so the, so the surface mount stuff, so they've recently started to offer and I use them already. Um, they will solder on uh, um, through hole components. Okay. And, and they charge $3 per board plus I think it's point. I think it's point two cents, not even a cent. Point two cents per pin they have to solder. So still affordable. Right now, the requirement is that um, the components need to be in their database. Uh, need to be in their inventory. Right. And so you know they don't have it, then they won't do it. But still, I mean, if you can get let's say eighty five percent done, I mean it's of the socket. So when you the board shipped to you, a lot of the sockets are already soldered on. A lot of the right. surface mount stuff's already surfaced and mounted and all that kind of stuff. It just reduces the amount of manual labor has to go into finishing up the board. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, the the other day I saw a, a small chip, maybe a, well, a board. It's maybe an inch and a half by an inch, and it said it was a, a early PC complete with a a um, some kind of a IO on on the one end of it. So what they've done is they put uh, everything from the motherboard on this little chip in a surface mount chip or whatever they can do the same thing with our coco 3 right do you think oh basically no, you're talking about i think you're talking about um this tiny little single board computer running yeah but it's like an inch yeah inch? yeah it's real tiny it oh. emulates uh um i guess it does uh cga and vga out and everything pretty cool well, i mean i i Again, you know, I'm I'm still learning uh, all this stuff that's in the community, but there is a, you know, there are F Coco FPGA projects out there, right? That I guess are, I guess, analogous to that. So everything could be on a small little board. That's Interesting. Amazing, amazing they can do this. Well, cool. Thank you, uh, Pedro. For those, uh, if you want to give us the link to, uh, maybe wants to put out his uh, YouTube link in our uh, chat for his Rocky Hill YouTube channel, just if you guys want to see what he's doing. He's doing some cool stuff. Um, I just have one brief update slash announcement to share, and then we can move on to the game on results. But uh, if you are a member of our Coco, Coco Discord server, and you've been following the Coco Pie channel, um, we are working on a new image for the Coco Pie project. So, and uh, it's not going to be on the website yet because it's not quite ready for prime time, but it is available to download and burn in test. So, the current work in progress Coco Pie community image link is in our Coco Pie channel on Discord. And I also published, uh, I also put a link to an unpublished YouTube video on kind of how to walk through, set it up 
and get the ROMs and get some software repositories and some of the cool new features that are going to take place with uh, ease of use and real-time clocks and MC10 and the MC server and, and how to get the Coco SDC image running on there. So um, there is a work in progress image to download and burn for those who want to try it. And there's a kind of a walkthrough video showing you how to set up that image and how to take advantage of some stuff, hit the ground running with it in our Coco Discord server that's kind of still insider information. I don't want to put it out on Facebook at large. I don't want to put it on the web, but it's good enough to use. It's just not quite ready for the, the world at large. So I would encourage people to get it, download it, and try it. And we need people to give us feedback on what is working, what isn't working. Um, the nice thing about this new image is that it will run on a Cocoa, it will run on a Raspberry Pi 3, a Raspberry Pi 4, and a Raspberry Pi 400. You just have to run a few menu options and do a few internet updates to get it to get the right drivers and configurations for whichever platform you're running on. But everything that you need to do to make this thing future-proof can now be pulled in through the internet through a menu option so we don't have to keep re-imaging this as we move forward, including getting new updates to MAME and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's a really cool, very promising future for the Raspberry Pi slash Cocoa Pi project. And we need some people to kind of uh, drive it around the block uh, and kick the tires and whatnot and uh, make sure we're getting all the bugs ironed out so we can make this available to the public. Um, I noticed there was a handful of questions on the Cocoa Pie Facebook group uh, throughout the week that I came across, like people saying, how do I get the ROMs copied? Well, there's a menu option for that. And how do I make this happen? Well, there, you know, and, and if you go to the cocoa Pi website, there's a number of YouTube videos that show you how to get it on the Wi-Fi, how to download the ROM images to get things up and running. So we've spent some time trying to, um, give people the tools they need to hit the ground with the Coco Pi. Another question that came up was the question of the P key, where if you're typing on your Coco and you happen to type the letter P while you're typing out a program listing or whatever, P is the pause key for MAME. And, you know, some people say, well, is, uh, that's confusing or that's frustrating. And yes, but that's what MAME uses. Now, MAME was originally designed to emulate an arcade machine, and most arcade machines didn't have keyboards, so the fact that P on your keyboard to pause Pac-Man wasn't an issue, but now that we're using MAME to run a computer with a keyboard, and we are going to press the letter P at some point in time, yes, that's going to pause, but I also have a YouTube video on how to configure, you know, how to reconfigure MAME, and uh, we don't want to try to force a configuration on somebody and what we think MAME should be. MAME is what MAME is, and you need to be a little bit familiar with some of the defaults and a little bit familiar with how to kind of fine tune them to your preference. But there's a ton of resources out there, and the Cocoa Pie project is a cool project. Uh, I like it. Uh, I would prefer this myself over something like an FPGA. I realize there are pros and cons to hardware emulation, but it's a very inexpensive way to experience a lot of machines and a lot of software. Uh, very uh, user friendly uh, and I'll leave it at that um, anybody else have anything they want to say about updates acquisitions questions comments etc before we move on to game on results where did you say the installation video is in discord on uh, the coco dash pi channel uh, which is under the hardware okay. category all right I know there's only like 9,000 channels to have to try to yeah, sift through to get to it. Group 12, sub entry yes. number eight. And honestly, I had a hard time finding it and I posted stuff there. So, yeah, I feel your pain, Ron. Um, if only we had a channel, we, we need a channel guide. We need a channel channel to let us know how many channels we have and what kind of channels we have on Discord. That's what we need. All right. So, are we ready for the game on results? Nick Moroda, yes. are you ready? I am. And unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to even see what the game of the week was last week. So I'm going to learn what you guys played this week because I've been so busy. I'm behind. But uh, I do have a little insider knowledge on in what our next week's game is going to be. Spoiler alert, but no spoilers for me. Um, and I believe and I hope that we might have a new Coco Thoughts that might may or may not be tied in to this may or may not be a musical parody not sure but we're going to find out so we're going to start off with uh, coco thoughts and then we'll get into the results here we go and oh, now boy. coco thoughts i kicked a rock by samuel guy i jumped fire I kicked a rock, <laughs> I 
jump fire. I am a pastel ninja. <laughs> Didn't expect that, did ya? In fact, those enemies want to injure. But it is a pain that will linger. I kick the rock. I jump fire. I kick the rock. I jump fire. Oh, I smelled a kung fu fighting parody coming on, but I wasn't sure where he was going to go with that. Pastel Ninja. Didn't see that one coming. And you know what I love about Samuel Gimes is that he never phones it in. He gives 110% performance to each and every one. Um, and that is what we come to expect. Yeah, much to the detriment of Ron. Yes. yes. The bar is so <laughs> high that it takes... Can I, just say what, can I just say what I like about it? Yes, Ron. <laughs> too, too much I'm yes to oh my goodness samuel gimes always giving 110 percent, giving it till it hurts and trust me that one hurt um uh, that was very good mr gimes thank you for that uh <laughs> here we go oh uh was it on mute did somebody say it was on mute uh, those in the live stream, did you guys hear the music? Because that should not have changed. Real quick before we move on, I want to make sure everybody was able to enjoy that audibly because I will gladly play it again. And I know Ron wants to hear it again. I want to hear an encore on that one. Uh, but I think it's fine. Whatever happened. What? Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mike Miller's saying, is, was it on mute? No, Ron's love uh, was on mute. Ah, oh, okay. There we go. All right, so we are now going to get on to the results of last week's Game on the Week, and here we go. In three, Mississippi. Two, Mississippi. High score challenge. All right, welcome to this week's results. This week we played Ninja Warrior with 15 scores submitted. Mr. Dave, 1,900. Exile in Paradise, 7,300. Canadian Retro Things, 11,800. Tom Gun, 11,800. Sabhead, 12,100. Me, 12,400. Rich N, 13,100. Tom C, 15,700. Pedro Pena, 18,600. Jim Rye, 20,700. David Craker, 22,500. Tasman, 23,500. Paul Shoemaker, 27,000. L. Curtis Boyle, 33,300. And the number one score this week belongs to Buck Owens, 34,700. Thank you to all of this week's participants. Coco Talk salutes Buck Owens. Owens! All right, Buck Owens has reclaimed the title of the top scoring player of the week. Been many, many weeks where Buck Owens was not number one. Good to see you back, King of the Hill. Um, and Nick Morota, your hair is looking fantastic, sir. Oh, thank uh, you, you are an inspiration to all of us who have hair, and probably to some of us who don't. Um, Hold on, what are you trying to say there, Stevie? I'm just saying Nick's hair is awesome. Wasn't talking about you, Greg. <laughs> Everybody's in awe of Nick's hair, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, uh, yeah, that was, uh, so Ninja Warrior figured it out, Stevie. Ninja Warrior was the game of the week. Everybody was pastel ninjas. <laughs> you guys see my screen? Uh, we see it, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, great. Yes. So, uh, there was a Hot Cocoa review where they thought it was a, a, a good game. Deserves high score. Among Hold on a second. Games. What is this word here? I first look askance. Askance? What is that word? Is that English? 
Where are you? I've, Scans, yes. I've oh, first yeah, I looked askance at Ninja Warrior. What does askance mean? Like casually? Mm hmm. Yes. Okay, that's not in my vernacular, sir. I'll have you know. But uh, well, it's, it actually, it's a negative connotation. You, if you look askance at something, you look at it with this with disdain. Oh, okay. I looked was, upon with disdain Ninja Warrior. Well, the uh, graphics are pretty low res and chunky, and it's got the Puyan palette. So I could see why. Maybe visually he was turned off at first. Okay. It seemed like but, a uh, silly rehash of the moon hopper idea with the moon buggy replaced by a neophyte martial artist who must jump and kick his way. I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll never believe that the mountains of feudal Japan ever saw such goings on. But a few rounds of play showed me that this game was a true challenge to my reflexes and judgment. Wow, he came around. Look at that. You're a ninja. He did. <laughs> I read a little bit later, he says, the first two or three levels are rather easy, even boring. <laughs> ah, I like yeah. this guy. Ninja Warrior presents a real challenge to your physical and mental, mental reactions and deserves a high score among Coco Games. All right, positive review in the end there. Although he looked at it askancely, he came around and, and liked it. So That's right. So uh, once again, Canadian Retro Things provided this gameplay video. Thank you, CRT. Check out the Canadian Retro Things channel for uh, retro content. And I will Coco mention this video he recorded on the Coco 3, which doesn't yes. support the higher semi graphics modes, which is why the screen looks a bit odd. But, yes. Uh, and the palais are a little bit askew as well. I'm looking at this asconsley at this point. Um, okay. So, uh, now, CB, is this one you played? I, I have played this in the past. I actually did this in one of my DVD specials. I don't know if I did a, a public YouTube video on this, but I did do this for one of my DVD compilations of exclusive content. Um, okay. I, I was a fan of it. I believe in my playthrough, I made it to Yellow Belt. Um, I remember that I got a little confused on what I was supposed to do and when I was supposed to do it because you think you have to jump the rocks, like you use the Moon Hopper reference. You have to well, get used can. to the fact that you can actually kick the rocks. Yes. Which uh, is, which makes the game a little bit more playable. I don't think you can uh, kick the fire though, right? No. Oh. You can spear it if it's the fire that's flying from the sky. Uh, if you run up, you can spear it with your trident thingy. Kick the, the baby. Or say or it's called. Yeah. So is that, have you done that successfully then, Curtis? Yes, it's not easy. Oh, okay. And, and kind of a waste of time. And much. actually, the pastel <laughs> colors here don't look nearly as bad um, on the Coco 3. And Kevin has to drop off. Thanks for being here, Kevin. Looks forward to having you back on again. Look forward, Thanks, guys. Look I'll forward you. to uh, yeah. your project as it progresses. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh -huh. All right. yep. Later, Kevin. So it's... Uh, yeah, the graphics look kind of hand-drawn, cartoony, crayon-y, like a kid would draw a hollow stick figure type thing. But the playability, I think, is fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's actually even what I thought back in the day when I first got it. Because, I mean, this is only required 16K. You didn't even need joysticks. You can play it on keyboard or joystick. You can have it to six players at once. Um, but it's a game that kind of grows on you once you get used to it. And there's a, it's got pretty satisfying sound effects here when you kick rocks and spear the guy and... And not not so great when you get burnt up like a fireball. But uh, the one nice thing about it is you got all the different levels of belts. You know, yellow, you got you know white, and then yellow, and second level yellow, and I can't remember the exact order, but green, blue, red, and then you get your ten levels of black. But up until you get to the black belt, it keeps adding something new each level. So there's more stuff to learn. So you kind of learn as you go, type thing, which is always a fun thing to do in the game. You think they could have raised that thing he's got in his hand a little bit? You mean his belt? No, oh, the, no the, uh, the uh, yeah. trident. The trident that he's sticking out. Well, yeah. when he's you not know, sticking it out. Yeah. Oh, when he's not sticking, when he's it, not out, sticking, he's it, sticking out. it out. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I believe Buck Owens made a comment. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, about something that his wife thought he looked really happy. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and that was children. a joke back in the day, too, I have to say. Okay. <laughs> okay. For sophomoric, what do you expect? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a good game. I never made it as far as the, the opposing ninjas. I just got to, like, the uh, where the fireballs were falling from the sky. And I couldn't get past that. <laughs> Ken says, is that a trident in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just happy to see you. Yes, okay. Yeah, when yeah. you get to later levels, I mean, they start adding double stacked rocks, which if you time it, if you jump and land on the top and you kick right at the last second, you can actually destroy both in a row. Um, the fireballs are coming uh, more and more heavy. They also got static or stand or uh, ninjas that don't move first, 
that you just, you know, walk up and spear them. And then you have the later on levels, they'll actually run towards you full bore. So you have to be really quick to get them. And later on, there's arrows that fire across you. Oh, and no. then, of course, later on, all that's happening all at once. So, you know, good luck. Ninjas wow. and arrows and rocks. Oh, my. Um, interesting. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't play it that long. But um, cool. And you have a kind of pseudo parallax feel to the scrolling where the floor is scrolling at one clip. Then you got the mountain range and the clouds. So not the best yeah. example And the mountain of range parallax. and clouds are at different clips, too. So it's three-level parallax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bit. So... Yeah. The weapon is called a sigh. S A I. A sigh right. of relief. Right, yeah. And depending on the weight, it could be a heavy sigh. All <laughs> right, so. <laughs> no, I, I always found this a really fun game. I remember when I first got it way back in my piracy days. Um, and like most people said, I was not that impressed with the graphics. The sound on the initial start screen is kind of grating, which you know didn't give a great first impression. But after I played it a few times as a teenager, I just started loving the game, uh, especially as you as you got better and you kind of learned the tricks and getting through to the further belt levels. And you keep adding new stuff to, to deal with that. It, uh, it has an exploration thing. Right, uh, right, right. So it's, well, you almost have to um, play it for a while to get to the point where you can get to where things get better. And if you kind of rage quit early on, you would never know what the future would have possibly held in store. That's where maybe something like an attract mode or something um, that would say, you know, it kind of tease at what you might have. I don't this this game didn't really have an attract mode or anything, did it? No, no, no just the time oh. the screen was flashing colors, basically. Oh, and uh, speaking of attract modes, that is a uh, something else that's going to be a new feature on the Coco Pie image. Where um, in the past, uh, Ron Klein had a, a menu option to do an attract mode where it would just cycle through all the standard Tandy cartridges and it would just run whatever that cartridge did for about a minute and go on to another cartridge and so on. He's expanding that um, attract mode now to pull things from the Ultimate SDC image too off of disks. So a uh, future update to the Cocoa Pie will start to run in attract mode on anything that's in the multi-thousand disk library in the Cocoa SDC image where your Cocoa is just going to randomly cycle through software, bring it up, run it for a minute, and then keep on going. So that's almost kind of a cool thing just to run in the background, you know, just random Cocoa stuff uh, running all the time like a screensaver almost, you know. Yeah, that's cool. I will mention one little trick. I don't know if most people noticed here playing it, but uh, the more you jump, the more open gap floors you will get. So even on level one where you normally would never get one if you start jumping, because you get extra points if you jump and then land and kick a rock, you get a point for jump, or you get points for jumping it and you get points for killing the rock too, so you can actually rack up your score higher. But then you'll start getting the gaps opening up more and more so that you know the more you jump, the more you have to deal with, you have to jump. Mm. Oh, Tim and Linder. Then, this, Tim Linder says, hey, I'm at VCF West this morning in Mountain View, California. Come to the exhibit hall and come find me and say hi. I wish we had planned this better where we could have done a live feed from there. But hey, Tim, if anybody's out there at VCF West, look for Tim Linder. He's that guy playing Dagrath like that idiot in the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, look at Tim. Thank you, Nick, for uh, uh, picking this game here because I know it was one of my suggestions just because it was such a fun one. And I know Mike, yeah. Mike Miller in the chat says it was one of the real time sync games back in the day for me, many, many hours. Same here. It was one of the, my, my favorites actually after I got used to it. Yeah, I got to say, though, I'm still a little disappointed when uh, Bill Noble typed in DOD. I was really looking forward to seeing Dungeons of Daggereth on uh, Nitrous 9. So uh, <laughs> you got your work cut out hey, for you, that Bill. That might happen yet. You got your work cut out for you there, Bill Noble. <laughs> well, William Astle has got the source code now. That's so true. That's yeah, true. That wouldn't be too hard to port, I don't think. Not that I'm volunteering. <laughs> Not me either. <laughs> I remember playing this game as a youth. I forgot about it. You get a lot of fireballs. I do, and I, honestly, it never even dawned on me that this was kind of, sort of like Moon Patrol. Uh, but yeah. I and I loved how he called Moon Hopper, which was the Cocoa version of Moon Patrol. Yeah, it's a very similar to Moon Hopper, which is a complete ripoff of Moon Patrol. Um, but yeah, oh man, caught on fire! Boom. Yeah, fun, fun game. Um, hopefully some people that didn't get a chance to try it out earlier here or, or gave up on it too quick because once you get used to the timing to kick rocks and jumping the fireballs and stuff like that, you can also move left and right too. Though. I don't think Ken did too much. The Ninja video, Rover Patrol, Ken says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I made it, it to a, checkpoint. It is a fun game. Yeah, it's, I made it's it to checkpoint E. <laughs> yeah. There's also uh, it was one of the ones that was sold in uh, the UK for the Dragon too, because somebody had posted the artwork from the Dragon cassette port too. Oh, so. which I'm sure is a hell of a lot better. Pretty well identical. Well, it had PAL, so it probably looked cleaner on the. Screen. But I mean, though the artwork on the cassette, the packaging probably looked better. Oh yeah, I mean. yeah, yeah, that would look yeah. pretty good. Yeah. I, I haven't seen the Coco versions that artwork actually. To be honest. I'm going to say Xeroxing and Ziploc bags were involved. Taking a wild <laughs> <Probably>. guess. <laughs> cool stuff. All right. So and, any uh, tips, tricks, other than what Curtis has been saying? Anyone? You can spear the, the falling fireballs. I wouldn't do that. It's, 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 it's hard, it's difficult, and it's usually fatal, so I wouldn't bother. You will notice that there are certain patterns of fireballs and rocks later on that come out. There's a certain set number of patterns for the most part, and you can kind of anticipate what you're doing. Uh, timing is a big thing, though. I mean, you have to time your jumps on the fireball, especially if you get fireballs rapid fire in a row. You'll, like, basically hold down the uh, the jump key or, the you know, lift the joystick up to uh, jump several times in a row. Sometimes you have to back up in order to not get burst into flame. Um but yeah, I mean, the later levels get insane. I know uh, a Buck Owens actually found the uh, cheat pokes for it so you, you wouldn't lose men because he wanted to see what you know, what the final level Grandmaster. Mm. And basically, the black belts, just uh, and they don't add anything new, but they start giving you everything at once. So you might have a double high rock, falling fireballs, an arrow, and a running ninja all coming at you at the same time. So it gets incredibly difficult. But uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty pretty hard game at that level. I got to the second level black belt on my score barely. So... Cool. I found keyboard easier. That's one thing I will say. Than joystick. Uh, keyboard. Nick Marot, are you ready to tell the world at large and at home what next week's game is going to be? I am. And so any significance it may be playing into next week's show? Well, I'll, I'll just speak briefly about this because I'm sure Curtis and that will fill you in more. But next week is our Dragon special. So we wanted to do a dragon game, and we got uh, input from the panelists as to what game, uh, what games were popular in a dragon to feature. And we had uh, one that was a clear runaway, which we're doing this week, and then another one came in second place, which we're going to do next week. So this week's game, uh, which also has been ported to Coco 3, so you can find it in, in, on the STC image. Uh, so. I, this game is, I know Curtis knows it. Dun, dun, dun. Yep, I won't spell it. It is called Chucky Egg. All right, A and F software. A game. So it is, it is keyboard controlled. Uh, I don't know if there's a joystick option. I've only been able to make it work, work with the keyboard. So basically it's your platformer, collect everything, avoid the crazy, I think it's a duck at the top. Ostrich, something. Ostrich, Who duck. Knows? I don't know. I'm sure Sixy or some of the people in the chat can uh, <laughs> give us the accurate description. An angry yeah, this is one of the all-time great Hall of Fame Mount Rushmore type games over in the UK. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a legend. So, well, literally, like I said, um, <laughs> Jim Rice who... says Jim Rice had joust on ladders. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everybody who gave input to the games mentioned, like we said, you know, name two, three games. And everybody pretty much named Chuck Yeg as one of the games that they really liked. Yeah, so. just to give you a bit of focus, I mean, um, John can go into more detail because they've played Chuck Yeg and some of the other platforms that got it because this was hugely popular around basically every 8 bit in the machine in the UK at the time. But we had 11 votes for Chuck Yeg and only three for the second place finisher. So that should give you an idea how vastly yeah. popular this I, I was. Think, in Dragon. I think Chuck Yeg first debuted on the BBC Micro, but of course it was ported to every system under the sun over there. Uh, the Amstrad got a port. Of course, the, the C64, the Atari 8-bits, and all that stuff. So it's only natural that the dragon fell in line. Yeah. Could so, definitely use a little palette hacking, but um, Yeah, it's good. definitely possible since it's on the Coco, for sure. Yep. Um, 6E says it's hens, and the duck is in the cage. Aha, mm. uh -huh, I knew there was a duck somewhere. Okay. So this is playable in X Roar if you want to play the dragon version, and it's yes. playable uh, in uh, on Coco if you want to use the Coco version, obviously. So uh, they're identical. So play whichever version you would like to play. Which means that if you wanted to pull this from the World of Dragon archive, or maybe even in the Color Computer archive, there's probably a play online where it's for that, especially since it's only keyboard, you could play it online through the browser. 
Yep. Yeah. You don't, if you don't have to worry about the whole, you know, difficult and both, thing. And both of, archives support that, so you can play the Dragon version right. and the Cocoa version yeah. on your respective archive. Oh, neat. Okay, All Mike right. Miller says it's Spuggies. We used to call those ostrich things, called them Spuggies. They're spuggies. Sp spoogies. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Maybe 660 I'll that says, out. by the way, best game ever. Uh-huh. Ken says nice. he's surprised it wasn't a Cuthbert game because Cuthbert is rather popular with uh, with the uh, dragon and you know kind yes. of UK EU community out there. I thought the same thing. That would be a Cuthbert. <laughs> Ironically, game. neither of the top two finishers fe featured Cuthbert. No, did Cuthbert appear at all in any of the ranking? Any of the favorites? I don't remember. Yeah, there was a there was a couple that he appears in. There's also a, there's a bit of a news story. I'll be talking with one of the people who's actually going to be a guest next week. Uh, but he posted some photos. The, the Cuthbert um, mascot image is actually used on multiple microdeal games that have nothing to do with Cuthbert. Okay. Because that was kind of their, their mascot. Right. Yeah. So, Curtis, too, I don't know if you if you checked Facebook this morning because I tagged you, but we got a comment on our Coco Talk page about the Dragon special by someone who says he actually had worked on one of the assemblers for the Dragon. And so I had tagged you saying, well, you know, I don't know if we have time to get him on the show this week because the show has pretty much been booked and stuff. But um, check, check, check Facebook later on for that tag. I don't remember the person's name, but n another dragon person. Yeah, you did is, some ham radio stuff, too. Yeah, so yeah, there, yeah, there's yeah. actually a couple people that have contacted me already in addition to that guy that, you know, kind of I, I think at the beginning, people weren't thinking we were too serious about doing a big dragon special. Now that mm -hmm. they've seen the promo and now they've seen all the guests we're going to have. I think we'll have to do a second one. With oh, a absolutely. New faces. Or even so. just continuously fe fe featuring a, a dedicated dragon segment. Like we do try to cover dragon in the news, but like a dragon segment where we can talk intelligently about something that's going on in the world. Yeah, and maybe dragon. have a, a dragon guest on. Some a dragon or guest or as a recurring it. thing, which, which yeah. have, that, that invitation has always been open, but maybe now we need to make that a little bit more of a formal invitation and actually, you know, uh, you may, maybe get some uh, contracts involved or some, you know, yeah, and we want to set up a lot more interviews too. Like a lot of people that will be on the Dragon Talk special because it's going to be such a long show. Where they're only going to have like 15 minutes to go over their their stuff, and there's several of them that have done far more that it will never fit in 15 minutes. So we'll we'll try to book them on for separate interviews later on too. Right, right. So uh, and 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 in just a minute here, we're going to do a handoff to the Internet's own Grant Leedy, who will pick up the second part of the show. But I want to kind of wax nostalgic and and wax appreciative here for for just a minute because i I've, I've been going through a lot of stuff with the home renovations and work and life and everything else so i've been super busy which is why i have not been on the show as much and so to that note i just want to thank everybody who continues to keep the show going the mark bosley's of the world and the and the grant leadies and the curtises and the mark overholzers and the nick marotas and everybody who keep the show going and keep keep it going and the audience who is here um, you know, I, I just, I was just thinking back cause, uh, somebody, I, again, I was kind of just skimming a few things and somebody was on the, I was reading the Coco mailing list and somebody was talking about, yeah, Coco Fest might not happen and Canada might not be able to make it. And have you guys ever considered doing a virtual Coco Fest? And as soon as somebody asked that question, I'm thinking, well, you've obviously never heard of our show and that's okay because there are going to be two or three people in the world who haven't. But, um, so I, I took that moment to look up the link and post the link to last year's virtual Coco Fest. And I started watching the first few minutes of it. I'm like, my God, that was a damn good show, man. That virtual Coco Fest was six hours of awesomeness. And that's what this dragon show is going to be. It is going to be an awesome show. I mean, every episode of Coco Car Talk is a good show, but we've got some great shows out there too. And this dragon one is going to be an awesome show. So I'm re really, really, literally excited about that. And, and all these guests and interviews, you know, um, you know, we have uh, Ron Delvaux has been bringing them in. Curtis Boyle's working on, on booking guests. Every time I wonder, are we ever going to run out of steam? You know, is this train going to run out of steam and is it going to stop on the tracks? I don't see that happening because you got people like uh, Pedro who keep making new motherboards and stuff. And you got the freaking Coco IO boards. You got Nick Marota's hair that continues to get better looking every week. You know, it's just <laughs> like we're never going to run out of something cool and fun to talk about. And, you know, there was a time earlier on where I was really excited about trying to share that with the world. And I was trying to, 
you know, try to spread the love on social media. And I felt like I kind of got my hand slapped a few times. And so I'm kind of butthurt about trying to be excited and promote this show myself. But I would love it if other people who feel like I feel and say this is a cool show to try to spread that word and spread that love. Because for as much as we've grown as a show and as much of our audience has grown, I know there's a lot of people who've still never heard of us and never seen us. And I think things like this Dragon Special are just going to be a great resource um, showing how committed we are to uh, retro communities and what a great program this is. And I would love it that if more people found out about that uh, and just joined us because I think the people who show up every week in our live chat, we know who you are. We know you by name. We see you every week. You're committed. You're consistent. You know, we've got our regular panel. It really feels like we have something special it's not just a show it's not just blowing smoke or blowing hot air it really feels like something and i think that feeling for me has continued to kind of impress me uh, and alan's mentioning that sept tandy's coming up so another excuse to uh celebrate but yeah i think a lot of great things are happening and i just want to say thank you to all you guys who have been keeping the keeping the track on you know the train on the track and all the audience who's still here with us and all that kind of stuff so I'll shut up now about that. But it's not every day I say something nice to you losers. So just uh, take it for what it's worth, right? So, <laughs> Who are you again? You're right, 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 right. Aren't you an ex-employee or something? Right, that's right. That's true. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on probation, right? Just but no, I'm really... pink I, slip. Yeah. I'm excited about the future of our hobby and our community, you know, because it just seems like it continues to grow. And it's all positive, you know? Agreed. All right, so we're going to take a brief pause here as I stop streaming, and we're going to get the stream set up again, and Grant's going to pick up on part two. So if you're watching us live on YouTube, you're probably going to have to refresh the playlist to see part two show up here in a minute. If you're watching us on Twitch, it'll go dark for a minute and pick right back up. If you're watching us on Facebook, it's going to start a new stream. So if you're watching us and you want to see part two, you're going to have to, wherever you are, most likely refresh that page you're on to get the to get part two of the stream, but I'll update the description so it will say part two. And join us again here in about two minutes for part two of Coco Talk episode 224. Until then, Stevie Stroh saying later, bitches. <laughs> later. Oh, wow. All right, welcome back. And we have gotten rid of that stinky Stevie Stowbridge. <laughs> Let the real show begin now. I'm right here, Greg. Oh, oh, sorry, darn it. <laughs> Quick, hang up on him. Wasn't he fired? Kick him off. <laughs> All right, guys. We are going to go uh, start off with uh, George and his uh, his assembly language. So let me get the intro up, and then George will be right off to you, okay? Here Ready. we go. All right, we are now back with George. Take it away, George. All right, pop me up here on the screen. All right. Is uh, my screen showing yet? Spotlighting now for you. No, well, maybe. <laughs> I must have hit the but wrong button there. See, now Stevie goes and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> yeah, I think we might have to hire him back. Yeah. <laughs> we can't do that. He wants more money. Yeah, exactly. All right, George, where are you at? I don't see you I don't see you uh, showing up yet. I'm there. Have you started screen sharing yet, George? Or? His camera's I'm, not live. I'm not sharing screen. I stick you by whatever we did so my whole uh, video he's using oh there we go that's weird why is he not showing up we're getting buffering know. on youtube also i don't know you have the magic buttons That's really weird. Okay, well, let's uh, let me try something here. 
We're that smooth, folks. All right, there we go. Now we'll try this again. There we go. We got it. Right, here we are. We're, we're back. Okay, uh, assembly language programming for, and the key word here is beginners. Okay, we're not going to do video syncing. We're not going to do bit banging on the various chips and stuff like that. This is for beginners. So, the people who are uh, some of the previous talkers, presenters, they can take a rest now. And what we're doing today is uh, this year, I put this out on the Discord, okay, Facebook, we're gonna do. We may not get to all of it, we may not even do all of it. I just want to, uh, so that's what we're doing. So I got a whole bunch of screens here. I got to find out where they are again. Okay, this is uh, correction of last week's so what we, uh, we did last week. Okay, last week there was a typo on this screen here. This uh, one bit wasn't highlighted. I fixed that. And we never did get down to the very, very bottom page, okay, which is a very important page. All right, we would, uh, we're always talking about uh, branch equal, branch not equal, et cetera, et cetera. And the condition code register is what you really, uh, results come in. When you say, branch equal or branch not equal. And there's a, a whole series of different flags in the condition code register. The main one we want is this is zero one here, okay? When you do our compares we've done, and remember we're just doing these basic compares and branch high or branch low or branch equal. It's this zero flag is what we're looking at. It's either gonna be a zero or one and it will branch accordingly. There's a lot of other things there to look at, but we're we're not nearly close enough to talking about the, the other flags in there. Other two we might talk about here is the interrupts. We're not going to do interrupts, but I thought it'd be, we hear a lot about this in, uh, we, uh, in different people talking about the interrupts, okay? And there's two of them. There's a fast interrupt and a regular interrupt. And here's what you do to disable the interrupts. Here's the instruction. And if you remember in the macro lab, we put I put in there a, uh, macro that would disable them for you. That's the instruction it does to turn the interrupts back on. That's the instruction it does for you. So much for a correction from last week. Uh, next, I need to, next screen is, I got a lot of screens here. I want to go, go over something from, uh, from last week, if I can find it. We were talking about different things. This might be some nostalgic stuff, okay? Remember I started on this stuff in uh, 1968, believe it or not, is when I started uh, programming. There was no there was no CRT tubes. Everything was on a terminal. Uh, and in the early 70s, some of the terminals uh, we're, we're, we're now here primitive, okay? Fred Fredstone type terminals. Again, remember, no, no screens, okay? And all this stuff you see in this lower part of the ASCII table is stuff that I was using on the communications and the controllers and in the actual terminals. And the ones in front, like you see a lot of stuff when you're programming, you always see carriage return line feed or line feed carriage return. You always say, well, what is, what is that? Okay, well, the terminals I worked with, the one in particular was a call, it was an IBM 1980-9 terminal. And it was a typewriter. Okay, remember the IBM Selectric typewriter had the ball, whenever you type, the ball would spin around and bang on the paper. Well, that's all the 1980-9 was. It was that glorified Selectric ball typewriter with a 75 baud modem hooked to it. It was no intelligence whatsoever, whatever functions you had to do on a terminal had to come from the mainframe. So the carriage return line feed is just like a regular typewriter for, I don't know how if you're old enough to remember a regular typewriter, it had a little handle and you click it over one little bit and that pushed the paper up one and then you pulled it all the way back to the left. That was the return. Well, to do that on the, uh, this terminal, you had to put out, had to put out both of them. One of them you had to do a line feed 
Okay. And then the other one, you had to do the carriage return. The other piece of the carriage return was, if I can get down here to the bottom, is uh, this number 16 down here, synchronous idle. We had just always called it idle because that was, a, we had to put out, and I don't remember the exact number because this was, gosh, 40 years ago. We had to put out, and I think it was like right around 17, 18, 19 of these idles in a row. And that was the amount of time it took from that carriage, that ball, to go from the right-hand side of the paper all the way back to the left. So you did a, a line feed and a carriage return, you had to put in idols. Otherwise, there was no intelligence, so you had to uh, do it. This nostalgic, and I thought I'd mentioned it last week, but a lot of people never knows what all these funny looking uh, things are in this left-hand column over here. Well, this is uh, the ASCII table. And before that, this is not the table we used. We used a table called EPSIDIC. And that was extended binary coded decimal interchange codes. It was an IBM thing built back in the uh, 60s. And uh, you look it up on the internet and it'll really scare you. But anyway, that's what all these uh, low order things in the ASCII table was used for. It was all for, uh, used in them, that era of stuff. You could up here like number seven, you could ring the bell. If you had the uh, shift, there were shift keys in here someplace. I don't see them. Here we go. Shift in. There was a shift in and a shift out right there. 14 and 15. That's you wanted to shift up, go to uppercase and lowercase. You put sent them out across the line. So, okay, enough for nostalgic stuff. As if anybody liked it. Okay, now we're going to go to programming what we're going to do this week. I have to find this image over here. Okay, in your basic color computer one, color computer two, color computer three, in the documentation, little manuals, little folders you got with it, it gives you these graphic character codes that if you uh, hunt some codes in, I think at the top of this, it might have had an example. Well, so one place there was an example. If you put in uh, this code, plus 128 or something like that, and plus the color times 16, et cetera, et cetera, in this pattern, you'd get this to show up on, on your screen. Well, we're going to try to use them, and we're going to use uh, this upper left-hand corner, uh, upper right-hand corner, and uh, I don't know which other ones we're going to use. But we're going to use four, and we're going to make a little block. And there's a look at the difference here. You see this number one is an upper left-hand corner. The color would be the white square, which we can change that color. So we're going to use this lower one down here. We'll change the color of the white. Oops, I'm probably the wrong thing. Change the white there, and it'll stay the, the, the black in the center. So we're going to work with blocks today, moving blocks around the screen. That's what I've got to I got too many screens here. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is run the. I got already got a program loaded in here, and we'll run it. Okay. We don't see your emulator right now. Oh, I forgot to transition over to it. There Thanks. you go. There you go. Yep, I forgot to transition it. Okay, this little basic program I wrote. Okay, the graphic codes that I've took. I'm going to use these six codes in the program that we're going to. That we've written here. And the C after the color uh, and after the dollar sign is the color. So what a cursor didn't show up very good on the when I'm on the uh, main emulator. But anyway, this is another case where hex works really, really well because there's 16 graphic blocks, which is perfect for hex because there's 16 digits. Yep. So in decimal, you'd have to do all this math to figure it out. But in, in hex here, you just change that first character from you know eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F, and that's your colors. Yep, that's what we're doing. So in this, this example, they've got a C in the, the first one of each one of these, so all of them are going to show up as white. And believe me, when I'm running on the uh, the emulator and the RBG and the composite, either one, none of them seem to ever match from time to time. So if they show up white, we'll be in great shape. So anyway, if we just change this C to an A, it will show up as blue. Okay, so let's... 
Okay, and that's what a block is. That's we're going to use six of them characters: the upper left, the upper right, the two mid ones, and the two lower ones to build a block. Okay, and that's what a block looks like right there. So we're going to move that guy around the screen, or we'll, we'll elongate him in, in a bigger block. And I'll show you here's here's the final result when we're done. Okay, so we're going to move that thing around and size it up and stuff like that. That's what we're going to achieve with our assembly language program today. And believe it or not, this program is a little, only a little over. The code itself, the executable code, is only about 110, 115 bytes, bytes long. So let's try and find another. Problem when you have so many screens. Show. Okay, I'm just going to show you this, the assembly language version. I'm not going to show you, show you the raw ones before it's done because everybody seems to think that this white screen shows up a little bit better. And there, there's really two, there's really two programs here. I got one. One is the actual code, and another one is the data table that we include in here. But as usual, we're starting out the same way. We're going to use that. Color computer includes that we've been using in the past. I have, uh, I guess I should show that. I have, I did make some changes to that particular file. That must be in Notepad. I added the colors into that same file. That include file, so it, and it's in the zip file I put out there. I put in these colors here. It's used for the low res uh, screen. And they all start with underscore, underscore, because other places I had already used underscore black. So it's underscore, underscore black equates to zero, uh, et cetera. You get down here, you can see all here, like the, the uh, white one was at C0, we, I showed you before. The blue is A, the red is B. So we're going we're gonna to use them and put them into each one of our uh, uh, characters as we put them on the screen. Back to our other actual program. It takes me a while to find the screens on both. I got two screens, so I got to find them on both of them. All right, we're going to include our include file, which again, we've got it turned off because we print out a lot of stuff we don't want. All right, we got tables like we've been using in the past, arrays, whatever you want to call them. And this one here, is three bytes long. It has a column, it has a row, and the character. And the length of each one of them is, let me just say, three. Uh, we also have, we're going to be using the, the, a user stack. Okay, there's a system stack. When you ever see the instruction push S, there's also a push U. We're going to use that user stack today. So we're going to push it up. A little bit higher in memory, what we're usually doing with up at uh, hex 25. Our actual code, we're going to again, we'll argue it down and load 1000. And like before, we're going to branch to begin, which is here, because I got some things up the front that the basic program will be able to change. We've got a basic program that will be able to change the, the delay speed, we'll be able to change the color, it defaults to white now. And like we did last week, we also have a place for a patch. And uh, we'll talk about the patch and look at it later on. We have a one-time switch again for one time pass through a certain routine. We don't want to do it on the very we don't want to do it on the first time through. Starting our program, we're going to clear that one-time switch out. It's deep, it's already defaulted to zero, but we're going to clear it out and I explain why. Or I will. We'll load up that U register with that stack address, and we're going to load up the block table. So, all right, before we do any more code, let's go look at, go look at these tables. Okay, the, the, I'm going to include, and this is a separate file. Okay, it's called blocktables.asm, just to include it. And it's going to argue 1100 hex. Okay, and the block table has, I think there's 25 of them in here, two byte entries that are addresses to the other part of the table. This is a, this is a, 
in a sense, a double array, if you will. Well, so it's the first pointer is to uh, the array called column four five, which is right here. And in this table here, we have an FCB, which is a byte table. We have a column, row, and character as we defined up at the top of the listing here. And that's that upper left block character. Okay. Now here, I put a note in here. Character has color added later. Example, in here, our character is a 0E. And we're going to or that color into that character right before we put it to the screen. The next entry is the lower left column row character. The next one is the upper right and lower right. And this ends with X00. So we can be able to tell when we're going looping through here, we'll be able to tell what the end is. We have the next display. It's, got, it's basically the same thing other than we've added these the bids. So we can elongate that that block. So we got. So these are the different size boxes you showed on the little video demo. Yes. Okay. We're able to we'll put these here. The block the block will be able to throw. We got mids for the left, and we got mids for the right, and it goes on. And there's a lot of these. Okay. And this is a lot of a lot of stuff. This is a lot of copy and pasting because we're moving one column at a time. You notice here. We go column four and five, we go column five and six, six and seven, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to column 29 and 30. So we're going to go completely across the screen, move in one column at a time, and change in the size of the, the block. It goes big, and it goes little, and then it just stays. You can see there's a lot of code here. This is a lot bigger than the actual program itself. It goes on and on. It, we started at hex 1100, and down here we end up at 15. 80s, okay, so that's a, that's a lot of uh, code. There's better ways of doing this, but remember, this is for beginners, so we're going to just hand code each one of these entries. You could uh, build these tables on the fly when you come up one time, but it's still going to take the same amount of room but it could, uh, instead of hand coding. Put in our block table, each one of these points to one of them. This is a design table, I guess you want to call it. That's, that's what that block looks like. And we have a pointer to it and a pointer to the next one, the next one, the next one, and so on and so forth. So we get done. We've got all this. We got that switch, our U stack. We've got our block table loaded. And now we're coming to the main loop. The very first thing we're going to do, we loaded X right here with the block table. And we're going to do, load Y with what X is pointing to. Okay, X is pointing to the block table. It's pointing to right here, 1100. So it's going to load this 1136 in the X register. That's the very thing, first thing it's pointing to. And we're going to do the branch equal if done. Is it equal to zero? If it is, we're done. That's what the branch equal Okay, again, it's not equal to zero. It's equal to down here, that would be the end of our table. So we're on the very first one. It's not equal to zero. I'm doing a lot of scrolling back and forth here, but it's not equal to zero. If it was, we'd go down and we'd be done. Next one we do, we're going to do a branch subroutine to a little bitty weight routine because if you don't put this weight routine in there, it puts it on the screen and takes it back off almost as fast as you get it up there. You don't even really see it. So we've got a, a little loop in there to, to slow it down. Then we're going to test our one-time switch. Okay, remember we cleared it so it has zeros in it now. So it will do this time, this particular time, the first time. So it is a zero. So we're going to branch around this, this restore the previous screen instruction. Okay, we, we don't have nothing to restore because we didn't have put on screen on screen, so we can't. We should not try to restore it. So we do the skip, we come down here, and then we're going to increment that one time. So next time coming through here, one time will not be zero. We'll have a one. Now we get to the enter loop. Now, if you're a basic programmer, main loop would be for i equals one through something. The inner loop would for this would be for j equals something. That inner loop is a loop within a loop. So we get to this loop here. We're going to test that entry 
because remember, we loaded this up over here with what was in X. And that is a pointer to our first entry, which is at this 1136. So here's our first entry in that table. Column, row, and character. Our upper left-hand character. Back up here to enter loop. And it tests Y is at the end of the table. No, it's it's no, it's not because it's not zero. If it is, if it was a zero, we'd get out of this routine. We'd have all the characters at that particular block printed on the screen. So the next thing we do is branch subroutine print character. Guess what? Same one we've been using for four, five, six weeks. We've got that same print character routine with a few mods to it. Calculate the position of where we're on the screen and put the character. Well, take what's on the screen, save it, and put a new character on there. So coming in here, we're going to save some registers. And after going over this code, I looked through it again this morning. Didn't need to push the D, but it doesn't hurt anything. Okay, we really just need to save X and Y. Which we didn't need to. Load up our column. Okay, which is the very first thing. And then here, I got a little thing in here that says subtract two. And for a note, it says, oops. What that is, I put all this together. Column four and column five for this first block. When I got it all done, I was pretty far to the right to the edge of the screen. So I wanted to move it over two columns back to the left. Well, I could have come in here and changed this, this one here to two, this one to two, this one to three, and this one to three. And went through each one of these each, and changed each one. And I said, no, I'll cheat. So I cheated. Subtracted two from each one of the each one of the columns as we come into the routine. So you're adjusting your table on the fly, basically, to save a lot of retyping. Yep, I cheated. I went ahead and said, "I'll just fix it right here." And says, "Take." I just really noticed it when it was done, so it fixed. It's a, uh, it's okay. I uh, to do that. <laughs> and again, we're going to clear A, which means now D has zero zero two in it. We're going to push it D on the stack. And I think some people may or may not be having problems with this pushing and pulling and saving. We're going to talk a whole little segment right here at the end about that. We push that 0002 under the stack. We load up our current row, sort of load the length of characters on the screen, which is 32. We do our multiply. And then we add what we pushed under the stack back in. Okay, so we've got our column, we've got our, our exact position on the screen now. And this plus plus will bump the, the, the stack. Don't worry about that. I will, we'll look at that later. I, I got a good, I think a good one for it. Then we get the beginning of our screen. And then we actually bump X register by what we calculated before. Now we're actually pointing to the exact spot in the screen. We want to do something. All right, we'll load A. Here the note says, get what is there now. What's ever on the screen, we're going to load it in A. At this point here, we're going to push U, number four. The other ones up here was push S. That's S, that's for the system stack. U is for the user stack. We're going to push that the, the X and the A, which is our previous ad, the address and the character. We're going to push them to save it for later for restore. Now we're going to load up our character that was in our table. We're going to or our color, which happens right now. It happens to be white. We're going to or that into our color, and we'll store that character to the screen, which is like doing your pokes when you erase it. Next thing we do, we're going to go back. We're going to pull all the registers we, we pushed before, plus the program counter. Now, if, I don't know, I probably didn't talk about this before, but if I take this comma PC off, we'll, we'll talk about that later too. If I take that off, and what we have been doing before, we could have had a RTS there. We could have done a return sub. But to save the extra cycles, we just commonly just put it coming at the uh, end there. Yeah, that, that's a speed optimization. And we actually use that a lot in Nitrous 9, and a lot of games do this too. Yeah, and, and every everything, before we did the return cycle, and every one of these subroutines in here, you'll see that I've, I've used this here because I've just... Experience over time is just, it's, you save a few cycles and you just get, get, get used to it. Yeah, it saves you a bite too, so it makes your code both smaller and faster. So it's a, it's a good technique yeah. to learn. Yeah, and, and it, again, this is for beginners. We're not trying we're not trying to save cycles. We're just pushing some stuff to the screen, but it's good practice to get into. All right, so we've put our, or put, where was that? We put our character on a screen. 
right? We did, uh, we did, uh, where's we at? Right here. We did our branch subroutine. We've got this character on the screen. That was the very first character in that block of, in this case here, four. All right now we're gonna we're gonna bump the Y register to the next entry in that block. All right, we're going from this entry here. We're gonna bump it by three to this entry here. Now we'll be pointing to the lower left block. Okay, and that starts with the same thing, column 04. Is when we load that up. Right here, we loaded up the item length, the Y plus the three. Then we branch to the inner loop again, which is right here. The first thing we do is we test like we did when we come in and we test to see if that's a zero. Well, it's not, it's got the next column number. So we're not done. Guess what? We go branch, we put, put the character on the screen. We go through the same routine, restore the previous, put the new character on there and go through the loop again. We're gonna go through it four times. This one, this one, upper right, lower right, and in the next one, we hit this end marker here, which you were last week, I think I got might have confused people because I was using I was using a higher order bit as being the end. And for I think for our beginning stuff, we just use the zeros. We'll take the extra three bytes and, and use them. Okay, we finally get back here and we do our test after we got all four characters on the screen. So is, it, is this branch, is this one equal to zero? Yes, we're done. Go to done two. Done two is going to take our pointer in our main loop. Our Okay, if we were doing our far I equals, this will be our I loop. We was bumping to the next block and branch to the main loop. Okay, well, we'll look at that. Here was the first one we looked at it in this table. We're going to bump to the, to the next one, right? And it's not a zero because it's a, it's a real entry. So we branch to the main loop and we again, we'll load up that block address. Was it a zero? No, it's not a zero. Do our wait. It, it, we're gonna do the same thing over and over. The only thing now after the first time, the second time through, we're doing this test. One time. Well, it's not equal to it's not equal to zero anymore, so it's going to fall through to the next instruction, which is a branch subroutine to restore the screen. So we go down here to clear previous. Okay. Now here's where I got a I got a patch in here. We'll talk about it later. I just put the word patch in there when it assembles. I know the word basic program and where to get to it. The first thing it does, it's going to push and save our current registers because we're using them out in that routine. So we save them. And now we're going to pull off of that user stack. Okay, there's our U. We're going to pull three bytes off the stack. Remember, we saved the address and the character that was on the screen. We pull them off the stack. We load up. What we're doing is putting them in register X and register A. We store whatever A is in X and we've restored that byte that we've previously had uh, put the characters in. We compare after the, well, again, we're going to look at the uh, push and pull. After the pull, the stack, we pulled three bytes off the stack. The address of the stack will be decreased by three. Okay, and we're, we're looking for when we get back to the top of the stack, our 2500. Okay, and you can see over here, that's what it's looking for. So it's going to, we've pushed four characters onto the screen. So we're going to have four of these restores to do. If it's not equal to 2,500, go back to the clear loop, which is right here. Pull another three characters off of the stack. Store that character. Keep through this loop until we find it. Once we're done, we'll restore register X, register A in the program counter. And that's what our clear loop. We've restored the screen of, for them, them four characters. If we got eight characters, 10 characters, or 20 characters, we're going to go through that loop and restore the screen. So we did a clear screen. And the rest of it, again, is repetitive. Okay. Go back through. Look at the next, in, the next set of entries in here, the next one, the next one. And they're each pointing to a, a set of these displays of these blocks. 
over and over and over again. So again, the code is, so we, we argued it at 1000 and the end of the code is right here, about right? one, 1075 hex or 75 hex, which is about 110, 150, 120 bytes as far as the actual that code. The table is 400 and some bytes long. Okay, so let's go back over here and execute it again. Okay, and this is what that, that particular thing is doing. Okay. Not exactly the fastest game in the world with rockets and stuff going on, but for a beginner, you learn how to move more than but before. We was just doing one character at a time, if you recollect. Now we're doing a series of them, and each one of them that changes in size. And there's no video syncing. There's no that. It's just putting something on the screen. And, and you're you, using the stack here because the stack you can vary in size, so it's not like you have to reserve like the maximum size box every time, even if you're only using a small box at the beginning of the animation. And that way it just keeps adapting to the size of the box to store what was underneath. And so you can restore it after when you draw the box on the next frame. Yeah, it just takes and puts out there as many, many characters you put out there, it just pushes them on the stack and we'll take them back off. Uh, right. And we also have put together a basic program because we're not at a point where we can do, we haven't even begin to think about reading stuff from the keyboard other than one character at a time. But as far as uh, reading a lot of stuff in and manipulating it from ASCII character to hex, we're not there yet. So we're going to, we're still in our, our uh, basic, pro oops, our basic program do this. Talk All right. What color do you want? Now, I just put these in there, red, blue, white, yellow, and orange. Now they, sometimes they match up the emulator and sometimes they don't let's try the red one this time and what speed i'm gonna do average speed i think is probably about a four but again it doesn't look too red to me yeah you'll probably have to change the uh the default palette because you can type rgb for rgb colors and CMP, well, and then depends yeah, on your emulator setup yeah yeah but curtis mine is all together different because i've manipulated the color palette so much under my system oh, okay you're not running stock anyway <laughs> no nothing even close to stock I can get there, but that's okay. Just, just assume that that, that was, uh, and we could put blue in there and we could uh, slow it down. You can see how they, you know, that's all this thing is doing. Or if you just type in execute, it will take the last things we put in there. It'll go across slower. So it's not, not rocket science here, but for a beginner, I think it's something you can actually sit and play with and change and hopefully understand uh, what it's doing. Now, if we do the white one, okay, our right line was white on the white screen, it doesn't show up. But if we do it on the other screen, there it shows up. So it, it's something for the play. Well, I'm gonna do it one more time. Now you can see what we did. We had a, a data table that we took the information from, the, column, row, and the character, and we did something with it. Now we could, something different once we got there, as opposed to having that table, and you wanted to move this character around, we could you put some calculations in there, and on the fly, change row column. You could go up, go up one row, down one row, right? And like we did with uh, the other things we did with the arrow keys a few weeks back, we could do the same thing with this whole block. Now we know how to get a block of characters on the screen, and fix the screen, it would work. And believe it or not, this thing does restore the screen. It's doing all that stuff and restore at the same time. Now we had, uh, I need to look here. We have one more thing. We had the patch in there, right? Somewhere down in here, I got some code, okay. I, I patched it not to do the restore. How's that for a nice design? All I did was when it entered that restore routine, I just put a, a 
X39 in there, which was basically a return from subroutine. So basically, you're skipping but, the restoring routine right, entirely. If, if you look at uh, here, this the cursor doesn't show up too good on the uh, on Zoom, but uh, line 310. Well, I knew it. I figured out the line about 300. Figured out exactly where that patch place was, and we're putting a hex 39 return sub in there. Okay, now down here at 400, we're doing basically the same thing. And we know that instruction, that push instruction was at 34, so we're gonna restore, we can restore that. But every, if we leave it this, okay, uh, 300, okay, we'll get, we'll get that design. Now what's cool is if you do a run 400, it leaves what was on the screen, so it never erases the bad stuff that's on there. And now it's all fixed back. Okay, just something to something to play with. I think a beginner should have some uh, some fun using the block as opposed to just using the the one character thing. Right. Yeah. So if they change the data table itself, there you can change like you know the block so it's say wider instead of taller or. Oh yeah, I just I just out of clear blue sky, I just picked put the. Uh, one way to do it. So that'd be a good exercise for the viewer who wants to try this out. If you want to, like, once you get it typed in and kind of figure out what works there, you can actually go into the data table itself and then change, you know, the shape of the block. It doesn't even have to be a square. You can put like X's in color or something oh, like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's just, you know, that was just, um, my fact, I got started on this late and I just went ahead and threw something together that would give you, give you an idea. And that's the thing. If you're, if you're out there in the beginning, which I don't know if there's anybody out there doing this, it gives you a good basis to start. We went from one character on the screen. Now we're down to four, 10, 12, and uh, a whole bunch of characters that went in that largest block. The other thing I, I might mention, uh, being the time, but I'm not going to go back to that screen, but I pushed that, I put that stack pointer up at hex 2500. Remember, we just kept pushing stuff, and the longer that uh, display that block was, it got up to. Uh, well, really, it was only pushing like 84 characters in there. We had uh, four, 14 uh, times 2 is 28, three characters. We got up to like 84 characters on the stack, which isn't much. But if you just keep pushing stuff on a stack, if you don't watch what you're doing, you can, you know, run on your, right over your own code or right over something else. Yeah, that's so, called a stack overflow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And if you, you don't know it when it happens to your machine, this quiz it's, 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 it's kind of the same effect of a toilet. You know, things just go horribly wrong when it overflows. Yep. And, so, and what I did was that's why I uh, keep, uh, every week I keep putting the programs at 1,000. This week I put the data table at 1,100 and I pushed the stack up higher. And, and in normal programming, you wouldn't, you don't do that. You kind of keep everything kind of together instead of spreading it all out. But I think for a beginner, if you look at uh, the, each place especially if you use an emulator you can go out and look in memory and see what it actually looks like yeah all right let's talk about the stack okay as part of this we come right from right out of that program okay we started the uh i don't know how this is going to show up cursor there we go uh the current stack we started out at 2500 as far as our stack pointer was okay this is just this is that user stack okay that, that our push you and our first instruction we did was a push U, or X had our address of the character, and A had the character. And the actual code in that table is uh, right here, okay? The address on the screen is hex 04B, 04FB, and the character is a 60, or a blank, right? So when you look in the actual stack coming down, stack goes down. So at 24 FF would be the FB, 24 FE would be the 04, and 24 FD would be the 60. And that really looks silly when you look at it. FB 04, well, our address was 04, but when you look at core and look at the dump, okay, right over here, we're going to see it. It actually sits in there at 604 FB. And the push moved the stack pointer down three positions so from 25 went down to ff fe fd so our current stack pointer is right here now now if we was to at this point in time do it the, the restore right here we would say pull x and b 
it would start here and it would pull. And, and, the, and the push and the pull, it's, uh, there's a set order. There's one in the instruction, if you look at it, there's one bit it's used. And each, uh, one byte, I'm sorry, and each bit in there has what you're actually pushing. You're pushing the X register, the Y register, the A register. And if, well, if you push D, you get A and B. And the program counters, each one of them bits, you can look it up in these uh, manuals on actual 68 or 9. And so you put them in, I could put this instruction, I could push A and X. It could be A or X or X or A. It doesn't make a difference because the bit is set and it's going to push them. So it always pulls out in one, pushes one order and pulls out in one order. Reverse order, but pulls them out. So when you do a pull, it would pull these three bytes out and move the stack pointer right back up to where it was before. And that's why we, after we restore, we're kind of we're looking for, when everything's restored, we should be back to our 2,500. Okay, now if we, we push that first one, we put our next character on the screen, or we, or we, come, so we push our next character on the screen, we do the same exact thing, push X and A, and there's what the address is, 051B in a blank. We push, push them three on the stack. Uh, I got my pointer in the wrong screen, sorry about that. We put the, the next three on the stack. It looks just like it does there. And we go down three characters. That's where the stack pointer is. And I did this, three, I would have needed to do it three times, but I did. We push the third one on the stack and the pointer now is at 24F7. So when we do our pull, it will pull them three bytes and the stack pointer will be back at A. So if we're at seven, or if we go back, we're right up here at A. And we keep going up, up and up until we get back to 2,500. And when we compare to 2,500, it says, good, you're cool. We're done with that. So we put a lot of stuff on the stack. We didn't have to allocate any memory that was hard coded. We pushed on the stack and we pull it back off the stack. All right, another thing here we we'll talk about is uh, you know, put character on the screen. We put something in register D, we put the column and we cleared A. So an A and B, which is really D, if you recollect, we had that 002 and we put the instruction in there, push D, push SD. Now remember now, this is S is for the system pointer. This isn't our user pointer, this is a system pointer. So we push these two bytes on the stack, it does the same thing as we were doing with the other one. It, we're 7F2 Charlie, it puts 02 and 00, and you actually look at it, that's what it looks like in memory. And we pushed it, it's on there, and the stack pointer's moved down here. When we go back to add that D pointer, wherever the stack pointer's pointing to, it's pointing right here at the 0002. It will add that to the, what's in register D and this plus plus says update the, the stack counter by two. So if it's A or F increment by one, increment by two, you're back to two C again. So it's, we've used that space on the stack. Now we've just given it back. It's information is there, but the pointer's there. Uh, in some instances, you could be just doing adding to not to confuse them, if we were just adding to register A one byte, we would just put one of these pluses out there to add to it and update the pointer by one. So when we're doing D, we update it by two, get back to us. I will mention that this this is kind of a, a little bit of a faster, smaller way of doing, like you could go the more orthogonal way where you you do a pull SD to get your D back and then you could do an, you know, an add D or LEAX, DCOM X or whatever type thing. But this combines the two into one thing. So it's kind of doing the equivalent of doing a pull SD and then adding it to D all in one instruction. Yep. Yeah, we're trying to get some understanding of what this stack thing is. It seems to confuse uh, some people. I know it did me at first when I first got into it. Because I remember I come from a mainframe and uh, uh, mainframe computer networks before Ethernet and internet and stuff like that. And, we didn't have, we didn't use stacks, you know, and this, I got to the stack stuff with C programs and I didn't want, and I've had trouble with it at first. 
Yeah, and one other thing too, if, if, if people are coming from other 8-bit CPUs like, you know, Z slash Z80s or 6502s or whatever, they only had one stack. They only had the S stack. And the yes. 6809 is kind of unique in having a second user stack. So you can let the system, the operating system or whatever, have its own stack and do things. And you you have your own separate one you can use for whatever you want, which is kind of handy. It's real handy. All right, the next part here is what we're going to do with this uh, RTS or pulling stuff, okay? When you do a branch subroutine or jump subroutine, and start out at the uh, the, the um, program counter is sitting at one one zero one six. That's the address of the instruction that this branch subroutine is on. It will put the address on the stack of what instruction you're going to return to, not where you was, where you return to. So our branch subroutine or jump subroutine, regardless, it could be two or three bytes long, it will put that wh where you're going to go to. So we're going to, when we come back, we're going to go to 1018, which is the next instruction. So it just puts them on the stack like it did the other data we showed on there. But now the current stack pointer, it's been decremented by two. We do a re return sub. Okay. What it does is it pulls the last thing on the stack off, which is 1018, and it puts it in the program counter, and then it goes to that program counter. Magically, you don't have to worry about that. It's built into the hardware. The program counter will be updated to 1018, and it will click the next instruction after your branch subroutine. So you branch there, and you do the return. It comes back. I didn't put in here, I guess I should have, when if you... Push a bunch of things on the stack, and then when you get, you do a, you do a branch subroutine and put things on the stack. When you go back, if you do, pull the stuff you put on the stack originally, comma PC, it will pull the program counter, which is a return automatic. That's what we're talking about. You can save a save a few cycles and a few bytes in for. Good yeah, this, this is analogous, uh, analogous to uh, like go sub and go to in, in, in basic. So like if you have line, line five, go sub 100, and your next line after line five is line 10, when you do the go sub and then you do the return, you don't want it to come back to line five and rerun the same line again, which is why it's storing the next place to go to, the next line number per se. So like five, go sub 100, line 10, when you do the return at line 100, it comes back to line 10, not to line five. So that's basically what's happening here. Right, that's what I was emphasizing. What it puts on that stack is the next instruction, so what it goes back to. Good way to remember, push down, pull up, push down, pull up. Because remember, you, the stack starts out at a high number. You push something on it, it goes down. Okay, it just, it's a different way you would normally think. It just goes down, 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 down. When you pull, it goes up, 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 up. So push down, pull up. All right, let me find out what's next in my list of I don't want to add too much here. I want to try to keep these a, like an hour or less. Yeah, it's a bit too much to do a one, one shot for a lot of the beginners. Yeah, I mean the rest of the stuff is uh, that that one thing I do want to to find here if I can is I'm a uh, I don't know who's out there listening to this other than the people here. I don't know if there's uh, one person, fifty people or anybody at all listening to this and using stuff. I have a, a big concern. I don't mind doing it, but I don't, I'm not getting any questions or any hoopahs on Discord, like it's good, it's bad, you're goofy. I already know this stuff. I'm really lost. Can you help me? Not one iota of anything. So I would be honest, like George, most of the comments we've seen so far have actually been in the live Discord chat. Or, sorry, yeah. not live Discord, but the live chat, even including last week. I mean, or the last last episode of it, because basically people there say that yeah, they're watching. Like we just had David Lord say, yeah, I'm here. He's he's definitely paying attention to it. And there's there's multiple people that have said that before. So okay, I'm not well, sure. Maybe maybe they just kind of go through it at their own pace and kind of figure it out so they don't need to ask questions. But they are they are watching. Okay, well, I just would like to do. I've set up another just a Gmail account. Okay, my initials GBJ sixty eight or nine at Gmail. I would like everybody that's actually really using this code that I've put out there in the zip files and stuff like that. And just send me an email and say, 
thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, if you could do this, or don't do that. I don't understand this. Or if you, or if you're trying to it and you're lost and you need help and you're too embarrassed to say it in the in the in the live chat, if you're embarrassed and you're lost, email me. I don't mind helping anybody out because that's what this is about: is helping the beginners out. You know, a lot of people in this place knows exactly what they're doing. Don't be, don't be scared of it. You know, if a guy's writing, you know, a, a you know, 128k gunfighter astro screen shoot 'em up game. Don't worry about that. You, if you're trying to start and learn how to do some stuff, no such thing as a dumb question. Just ask, and I will be more than happy to help anytime. I right, one more thing here. I need some help. I have some five and a quarter inch floppies off my color computer that I got rid of back 30 years ago. And if somebody out there has the means to read in five and a quarter inch floppies on an old controller and be able to put them onto a memory stick, please contact me through that. And I'll be more than happy to do whatever it takes, and whatever it costs to get the information off these floppies onto a memory stick or something. And, and where are you located again in case there's anybody nearby that could make it a local drive type thing rather than you have to stick them in the mail? We have next door. I'm in St. Louis, St. Okay. Louis area. So for anybody in the panel or anybody in the chat or anybody watching this after the fact there, if you're nearby in the area and have the capability of copying real cocoa discs, uh, reach out to George and we can we can get all that stuff backed up. Yeah, I mean, the stuff I did years ago in the box on top of it, it's a regular Radio Shack box with the uh, floppies and on top it says Cocoa Keepers. So I want to see what's in there. <laughs> uh, That'd be like when we went through uh, uh, Rick Adams stuff. Yep, yeah, and I uh, have one one more thing. When using uh, MAME or MASS, either one, uh, is how do you, I, I cannot, I've the, work with that code and work with all the uh, Coco ROMs, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm trying to, how can I get a hold of the control and the alt key? I have not been able to get to it in any form. I mean, I'm doing my own key read. I'm, I'm strobing each one of the lines in that, but MAME or MESS does not pass that control key. And I, I, mean, I would I'm, check because one of the defaults in MAME is usually those are reserved for playing joystick games. So they're using control like fire button one and stuff like yeah, that. I, so I, might... went in, I went in and changed on MAME. You know, you go in and you can change what the key to, to give me a yeah. control. I can make it another key and I've tried it. I've made it in just some other key and I've strobed the lines and nothing ever shows up when I strobe the lines for control. It's gotta be a setting though, because I, I do that in oh, I'm, I'm, quite a bit and it does register the control and all, but I have mine set up to not be intercepted as, you know, joysticks or well, whatever. I, so. Yeah, but is, is that within the OS9 or what about in the Radio Shack Coco stuff? Is it, is it different? Anyway, that's why I'm asking for help. Somebody knows me how to change it. I've changed mess, I've changed name uh the, the default keys and I've, I've, I've drawn a blank okay i'll have to try it and, and i haven't i don't touch this basic all that often but uh, i'll have to try it in this basic but i mean the driver in nitrous nine it should be the same it's reading the pia the exact same way so it, if it works for think. me it should work in basic but yeah I'll, I'll give that a shot later i would think also i'll just mention that tom eric gunderson says also i'm watching i've only messed a little with the z8 and the amstrad so it's a little confusing but i'm trying okay so, Tom, if you have any questions, you can fire them off to uh, George at that email on the screen right now. Yep, I wanted to get one more thing up there, really. Won't take up any more time, but I can't seem to get get too many screens. I need to work on that. Ah, here it is. And if you're going to email me, and you want something down at the bottom, what's next? All right, you want to work on Cocoa one, two, or three stuff, uh, arrays, mass, strings, input, output, something that somebody may be, uh, may be interested in. I'll be more than happy to, to work towards it if I get a consensus on what people want to look at. Now we've been doing the same thing and I think we've pro progressed along, we've got a, a uh, long, long way to go. So if you have something you'd like to really do, let me know. Okay. So what, one, other shout quickie. Out to everybody. one more quickie. Earlier we were talking about the MMU register. 
Okay, in OS9? Yep. All right, here's my routine in on the Radio Shack side and RS-DOS, my pop-up windows. Basically doing the same thing. Okay, I come in this room for the pop-up. I turn off the interrupts. I load up the MM register, the one I'm looking for. Uh, I load it, get rid, get rid of the two harder bits. I save it. I put in the one for the high-res text screen, which I believe is, uh, it's up at six Charlie zero, zero, zero. I store that now into what my, under my working area. So now I've got a copy of the high-res text screen down in low memory. On startup time, I have a auto exec dot bat file that starts or basic file that starts. And it, it the basic program will actually change the MMU register and load a lot of code up in, the, in a whole bunch of different pages. And up above the high res screen, it only uses a few bytes. I mean, it uses less than a thousand bytes. So up around X3000, I've got the pop-up routines to be able to pop up windows on the screen. I jump, when it gets loaded in there, I can jump straight to 3000 because I know what's there. When it comes back to me, I restore the MMU register and away we go. I have a whole bunch of these here. I use a whole bunch of different pages for different things. I have a lot of code loaded in there. So I just wanted to share that, you know, he was using his uh, MM reg uh, MMU registers. I also use them. I got, uh, I don't know, six, six or seven different pages. I use at various points within the, the modifications or as DOS I've used. So good yeah. luck and good selling. I will mention that that uh, stripping off the high bits that you you might have to change for the the two meg upgrades. <laughs> yeah, yeah. burnt us a few times. Yeah, I'm only uh, using the emulator anyway, so five twelve. Anyway, I will quit blabbing now for a while. So, okay, Thanks so everybody, send in your suggestions to George at the email address he gave earlier as to where you want to go. I did see one response in the chat already. David Lord says I would like to see code accessing the hardware, so that's one vote for hardware. But we'll see what else uh, people do uh, send in, you know, what, what what they'd like to learn next. Yeah, because, I mean, a lot of this stuff, dick banging on the hardware is a long way away from uh, where we're at. But we'll, we'll, well, I'll see what comes in, if, if there's any emails come in at all, and we'll go see what the future has for us. Okay. We'll Thank also you. mention, because we've got some pretty busy scheduling with uh, interviews and stuff, especially oh, next yes. week, where, yeah. I won't be here. I won't be here. We're on account of uh, the, the Dragon stuff for at least the next two weeks. Next week yeah. for sure, and probably the next week we won't do anything. I will. I'll check with you, Curtis, uh, a week from now and see what's how things stand. Yeah, yeah. Like next week's going to be a monster long show as it is. So. Oh yeah. So that's I'm one of the reasons we're curtailing a lot of the regular segments just because it's going to be so so much for the interviews, et cetera, yeah. too. So. And, and you might have a carryover to the following week and that. So I'll, I'll figure out when the next time uh, I'll be on, but uh, I'll, I will be back whenever. Uh, Okay, well, enjoy plausible. your vacation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, feel free to pop by the show and participate on the panel. Anyway, if you have any questions for the Dragon people, you know, some of the hardware and stuff that they're, they're sure. dealing with. So. Yeah, because mine always is a boring segment, except for the beginners. All right, see you guys. Okay, thanks, George. Thanks a lot, George. All right, uh, we are going to go on for the Game on News. Is that what we want to do next? Sounds good. All right. Let me uh, get the intro going for that. All right. Take it away, Curtis. Game on news. Okie dokie. Wake me up when it's over, please. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the, the news is fairly short this week. This shouldn't take too long, except possibly some of the Dragon games, which hopefully Kieran and some of the others actually rejoin us there because some of these I've never seen before. So if I can get some details, it'd be great. So you guys seen that? Yes, sir. Okay, so first up, uh, last week we covered TKOM's Retro Gaming Nook. Uh, started doing videos um, of Coco games and usually doing you know some individual games. And now they're just starting to do some comparison games where they actually take multiple clones of an arcade game and then compare them all in one big video so in this case they decided to pick centipede and they picked i think you know six or something uh, different clones of it um so i'll just play a little bit of the intro here and i'll kind of go through some of the stuff they did so here they say they start with atomic's caterpillar attack which is an early 1982 one
what you do is you check out a couple of different centipede clones, I guess, huh? They won't play the whole thing, but they go through a whole bunch of them. So they've got uh, Caterpillar Attack. They've got... Uh, Color Pede. Oh. Color Pede. They've got Megapede. They've got Caterpillar by Aardvark. Um, There's Color Pede. Slay the Neris, Neris. I'm not sure how to pronounce the one from Radio Shack that Spectral did, but basically they go through and compare them all and they kind of pick which ones they like the best. Um, I think if I remember correctly, they ended up picking Slay the Neris as their favorite because it had some extra little bits in there. Uh, my personal favorite is Colorpeed, which is on the screen right now just because it's the closest to the arcade. Uh, but there's there's numerous ones. And actually there's a, there's one on the Dragon I'd not seen before that actually will be showing up when we get to the Dragon game stuff on Cup for a Dragon site. Um, but I, I really like the comparison format. I've seen, we've done shown some comparison videos between different platforms, say a Coco version of Frogger versus, you know, the Froggers that appeared in other platforms. And Steve and I have done some of these comparison videos a few years back of, of taking different clones or official ports of, of various arcade games on the Coco and, you know, doing a head to head comparison between them all. So I'm kind of, kind of happy that, you know, somebody else is kind of picking up that mantle because Steve and I haven't done that for years now. And there's, there's tons of arcade games that we have multiple versions of on the Coco. And more all the time, so um, it's it's a good video, and I'm I'm trying to get them on for uh, you know being a guest at some point here just to kind of talk about their experience with the Coco, the fact that it's a husband and wife team that are playing the games because that's not something we see all that often in the Coco community. It's usually just us guys. So um, interesting video. It's a good. It's a lot bit of a long one because they're going through quite a few different versions. They kind of you know give their you know, opinions of each as they go through them all too. So definitely worth a watch. Can't wait for their joust one. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully they pick correctly. Uh, <laughs> Pegasus, right? That's right. <laughs> Next up, Jim Gary had a couple this uh, week. So the first one here is the video walkthrough of Sunrise of, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Beth Selamin. Um, the spelling's on the bottom there. So basically, this is a text adventure that was written on the Sinclair Spectrum. And he's ported to the MC-10, of course. It even features a little bit of uh, low-res graphics you'll see here. So they get the picture of your character here, for example. So it's, it's kind of a, a low-res graphic slash text adventure game kind of combined. I'll just fast forward so you can see a little bit more of it. Yeah, I believe that's Planet Beth Selimen from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Is that how it's pronounced? I, I haven't listened to Hitchhikers in so long, I couldn't remember. And uh, if I remember right, that's the one that's so worried about the cumulative effect of tourist erosion that if you weigh more when you try to leave the planet than when you arrive, they lop off body parts. So yeah, if yeah. you if you don't excrete as much as you intake, and you know, like I remember yeah. that from the, the books, yeah, and the radio play. Anyways, it's kind of cute having a little, just that little bit of graphics on the top does heighten the, the game to me somewhat because it's not just the straight old text adventure. You've got a little bit of you know visual cues here too. So kind of an interesting one. This next one's a bit of a, an interesting one too. It's um, a game, and I, this is originally done in French, I think it was, because it was originally for the Alice. Uh, so I'm going to butcher because I don't, I don't speak French about it. Anybody here can, please correct me if I'm wrong. A sorcerer, which I think believe it means sorcery. So it's originally written by a guy named Rafi. I don't have no idea how to pronounce his last name either. Derry Guyon, sure. From a French magazine called Ordinaire Individual in their December 1985 issue. I'm butchering names like crazy today. So this was originally in Alice, which of course was the French clone of the MC10. So he ported it back to the MC10 and did the translations. And uh, the interesting backstory on this game is that he is speculating, and he wrote a blog post about it, which in a second here, but he's speculating that this might have been a partial inspiration for the Harry Potter books. Because uh, there's some stuff that seems to be in common with what J.K. Rowling wrote about in the Harry Potter series. And uh, I'd never seen this game before, so I can't speak to that, and I haven't played it to really know for sure. But uh, I mean, big standard text adventure game, but here's his, his blog posting on it. And where he kind of speculates and kind of goes a little bit of the history of the game itself here and what the game itself is about. And then he says one thing, and I'll just read this one paragraph for those that are listening to the audio version. One thing that has always struck me about this program is the parallels it has with the Harry Potter stories. The idea of sorcerers appearing from a parallel universe hidden existence, the attempt by them to take over the non-magical world, a mysterious castle. It makes me wonder if there was some possible path 
of inspiration that helped contribute to J.K. Rowling's development of the wizarding world of Harry Potter. And it is known that J.K. Rowling herself had studied Romance languages. Um, and it also uh, mentions in, on the internet some interviews she'd done and stuff in the past. Between 1983 and 1986, she attended or studied French with subsidiary uh, in classics at the University of Exeter in Britain. So she actually studied French. So maybe she had seen this French game and then maybe that kind of put something in the back of her head is his speculation for the uh, the Harry Potter series. I don't know if that's true or not. It'd be fascinating if one of us had enough pull to actually ask her and find out. But it, it's an interesting speculation anyway. And he goes through you know, some example stuff here of some of the things that are kind of like in parallel between the two. So if anybody else uh, has an opportunity to try to find that out from you know, if any of your personal friends with J.K. Rowling, please ask on our behalf. Now, Cuthbert Dragon's been darn busy this week. Um, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, this is screenfuls of stuff that's been added in the last week here, too, including Ninja Warrior, which kind of showed up last week. Um, but basically, started doing, there, there's a few here like Mega Bug, which, I mean, we don't need to show it, but it's basically using the alternate color set because, of course, they didn't have artifact colors. Uh, Glove is the uh, gauntlet style clone that James McKay did back in 2006 with the Coco and the Dragon, which uh, I think we've shown before, so I won't show it. Uh, this one called Slide here is a basic game, and it's kind of, you know, if you remember those little sliding plastic puzzles you used to get in cereals and stuff where you'd have like 15 numbers and you had the empty space and they would be all jiggled up in random order and you have to switch them all around one at a time to try to get them in numeric order. This is on a bigger scale. Um, with a much bigger playing board, so it's actually harder. You can see that here. And it's written in basic, so it's a, it's a nice little example of a basic casual game. Well, this is a casual game, it'll take you hours to play, I'm sure, but, um, you know, so it's one of the better basic games to give you something uh, a bit more advanced than the plastic version. So if, you're, if you got really good at that sliding numbers game, uh, here's your chance to play the, uh, the top-notch hard version of it. So that was one data fall. I won't bother showing it because it's basically just another Ketchum popcorn style game, but it's a, a dragon unique version of it. Jaws. Now this is one I think we'd shown once before from High Retro Game Lord a year or two ago, but he didn't really know what he was doing on it. This uh, Cuthbert Dragon actually does seem to know what he's doing on it, so I thought I'd play a bit of that because it's kind of an interesting, interesting game concept. So you've got a couple different parts to the game, basically two different screens. So the first one here, you're kind of like wandering the green ocean so obviously they have an algae problem um but you're basically shooting stuff and you're a rescue helicopter basically you're trying to rescue people from sharks and plus you get you know other bolts shooting at you and stuff here too and then here you're trying to rescue these people that are floating in the water and those sharks are swimming across so you pick them up with the ladder in your helicopter and occasionally the sharks will suddenly zoom up and eat a person. So you're fighting with the sharks to, you know, rescue the people before they get eaten. Like there's one of them going down now. So kind of an interesting concept. I hadn't really seen a game like that. I presume this is a dragon original. I don't know if this has been ported to anything else or came from like a spectrum or something. I haven't heard of it before, but uh, if anyone in the chat can correct me on that, please feel free to do so. So I thought that was an interesting one. Bells we've shown before. Dungeons, that's Kieran's. So he's actually played Kieran's game, and that's a port from the Spectrum, I believe. And it's it's gauntlet-ish, but not quite. The unique thing about Dungeons is that uh, each player gets a quarter of the screen, and you don't have to be in the same physical part of the maze in the dungeon. Like in Gauntlet, basically, if, if players run in opposite directions, as soon as they hit the edge of the screen, you stop moving, because it basically it keeps and forces everybody on the same screen, even if the actual players like five screens wide by 10 screens high or something in dungeons you get to go wander up individually so you can assign like you will get the gold key in this you know room over here and you go in a different direction and get something else so it's a bit more collaborative but also it lets each player play like to their own and not have to worry about where exactly everybody else is so you, and a multiplayer version of the game this does support four, up to four simultaneous human players um it can be quite fun and quite a bit different play wise than gauntlet because of that uh, next one up here is this Magic Midnight, which the actual game is called, uh, what's it called, Lack Lackland? And he's got a new monitor here, I've noticed here, too. This, this red monitor kind of reminds me of the guy with the lava lamp. 
So this this is kind of a text, uh, a, a low res graphic adventure game where you're wandering through maps and you, you're doing various things, but it's got some interesting parts to it later on. <coughs> Excuse me. It has a unique battle system, I guess would be the, the main thing here. So I'm gonna fast forward a little bit here to the, because it kind of does this active bar graph thingy. Well, it's uh, actually firing up a spell, so that's a different screen. Here you go to the markets, you can buy some certain things. Hopefully you do get some pull. And here you're actually viewing your health, et cetera, and actually does a little bar graphs there too, instead of just printing a number like your, your health is five out of 10 or something. So here you've actually got status bars of your health with the little indicators of where you are. And then it does a little descriptions of each you know, attack as what exactly, what exactly has happened in your hit points drop, but it's all graphically done with bar graphs rather than just printing numbers. So I thought that was an interesting innovation of this type of thing, especially for a game, you know, back from this, this time period. So as far as a basic text adventure game with a little bit of graphical elements, I thought that was a pretty, pretty innovative way of doing things. We've seen a lot of pretty innovative adventure style games on the Dragon actually that went beyond a lot of the stuff we saw in the Coco. Uh, next one up, this one I have not seen before. It's called Morbid Mansion. It's another platformer, which is a, definitely a mainstay of Dragon games. And once again, in, in the UK tradition, they name every level. This is the evil, enter, evil entrance. It looks like there's a little bit of a timer in the uh, lower right corner too, which you actually did graphically rather than just a countdown timer. So that was that was kind of cool. It reminds me a little bit of Module Man for those who are familiar with the Spectral Associates game, because you've got the little doorways, you've got to get the keys to unlock the doors to get into the other screens, etc. So, but I thought that was a kind of interesting one. Uh, Invaded Revenge we've seen before. Castle Attack, I think we've seen that one before. Six and Nine Express. We have shown that one before. That's where the train's rolling across and you get the little switches on the bottom. You can see scrolling by and you have to steer so you don't run and crash into stuff. And then you get you know, random planes that just drop bombs and you have to try to avoid those as well. Um, this is Ultrapede here is the one I was mentioning earlier, which is another Centipede clone. Let me show you the little intro screen there. So the loader screen actually I thought was kind of cute. And Rainbow Software did a fair number of Dragon games. They also did stuff like uh, Rommel's Revenge, which is I think the battle, best battle zone clone we have in the Coco and Dragon computers as well. So a little bit of a different look than some of the other ones we've had. Along you know, the full range of vertical movement like the arcade did uh, versus say something like Caterpillar Attack, which only lets you move up and down one, one cell. Grand Prix we've shown before, Pettigrew's Diary we've shown before, White Crystal, I think that was a newer one I'd not seen before. Oh no, we have seen the one before, sorry. No, not that. Actually, we just saw the one recently. Temple of Zorm, I think. It's hard to keep track of all the ones that uh, Cuthbert's been doing lately. So, so this is a, a basically it's a text adventure game, but it has this nice graphical intro screen. But it has this little intro thing where you actually have to fly with the joystick or keyboard to land on that launching pad. So it looks like it's going to be a low res arcade game. But once you've complete that, then it turns into a text adventure game, which you do when you hit the surface. So kind of in a weird hybrid of, of two genres together into one, one game. I thought that was kind of strange. I hadn't really seen that done before either. Like I said, after that, it's just a text adventure game. So it's kind of a, a weird combo. Sultan's Maze, this was actually an interesting one too. It kind of reminds me a bit of, uh, what's that 3D monster maze or whatever it's called on the spectrum? Oh, ZX81, ZX81. We have the uh, Tyrannosaur coming after you in the maze and you have to try to escape. 
Because at first I was looking at it, it looked like it looked like Labyrinth or Escape or some of these ones where you just have to try and find the exit to the maze, but it actually does have monsters after you. And then it has some weird stuff that I was hoping one of the people in the uh, chat, maybe six, if he's seen it before, if uh, he can mention exactly what this effect is, because it's it's kind of a strange looking thing. I'm trying to remember where what's in the game it is here. Yeah, here. All of a sudden, this this weird thing happens. I don't know what the heck's happening here. So, Sixty, if you happen to know, <laughs> let me know what that means. I don't know if that's like a secret passage you're opening, or exactly what what is that. And then, of course, you got the actual monster chasing you down. T Rex is eating you. In this case, he died. So that's Sultan's Maze. It's sort of a, and I think it's written in basic. I think they're using like two two screens, double buffering, so it's drawing everything. Because there's a bit of a delay before it displays the next frame when you move. So I'm imagining it's drawing on the second screen, and then it just switches the display over there, and it just keeps flip, flopping back and forth to make it look smoother. Oh, 60 says, no idea on this one. Maybe the inlay would tell something. I haven't seen the inlay yet, so. Guardian Angel, this this looks like a scramble type clone, except there's not things on the bottom shooting at you that I could see anyway. There seems to be just you know stuff floating around, etc. You shoot, and there's uh, you know various attack things coming after you. You also have sights. So it looks like you have to fire to a certain distance, so you have to fire to where the sight is. It doesn't just go across the screen and wipe everything out on the way. So it takes a bit more finesse than scramble does. And at first, you get just these simple missiles that just fall down towards the ground, you know, type thing. So it's basically just bonus points. It's not really, you know, all that much of a challenge at this point. But later on, it starts sending out these yellow, you know, TIE fighters type saucery things at you, like that one. So that you have to dodge or shoot. And then it's got these landing portals, like you just landed on there, and it'll say the word landing on it. So you go in that, and then you drop into the second screen, which is kind of like a lunar rescue, or, or I think that's what it's called. In the arcade so it's kind of combining two arcade games a, a, a scramble-ish game and then it, it combines with the lunar rescue type game into one so i thought that was kind of cool you get two games for one basically at this point and of course you can die so i thought that was a rather interesting one um super scale hangman and the wizard's lair he just added since the show started so that's old bull news to me i mean hangman we all know what that looks like Wizard Lair, I'm going to take a look at it. I don't remember seeing that one before, and I have no idea what this is going to be. The blabby one from 85, it looks like. And 60, if you know this one, let me know. It's a nice music. Okay, we've kind of seen this... Um, style before this one might, might be a sequel to one of the earlier ones because i remember some of these graphics actually but it looks like there's an extra inventory status thing on the right that the other games don't share 60 correct me if i'm wrong and all that okay that looks like an interesting one anyway cuthbert like i said he's been really really busy this week so he's been just cranking out the videos so go check him out Next up, Tom Eric Gunderson is actually in the chat, so he can maybe chat us up a little bit on that too. So he mentioned that uh, way back in 1987 when he was in school, we had a computer class with CPM and SDOS PCs. We we're mostly left to our own devices programming in Turbo Pascal and GWiz Basic, which was, of course, on the original PC. Um, it's not much help to get. So he wrote this game, and this is basically the, the snakes game, you know, where you're trying to not eat your own tail and you get longer as you go and pick up items, et cetera. It's written in uh, a text mode, basically. So it's using like number signs for your snake, et cetera. So he wrote this in GWiz Basic, and he later ported it to the Amstrad CPC 464 he had at home. And his Dragon 32 had already been put away in favor of the CPC by then. So recently he decided, what the heck, he'd dig it back out, and he'd actually get it running on the Dragon, which is what he's done here. And of course, it starts slow and it can run much faster as you get up in levels, et cetera, here. So, unlike you know, the other standard games, that your tail gets longer every time you catch one of those. Can't run in the walls, can't run in your own tail.
I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool, I haven't really seen a text version of it before. Um, so it's a rather interesting way of doing it, but uh, it's pretty cool. I I'm, I'm, would have to ask him if the text was chosen because that's what he did on the original CPC and, and IBM PCG was basic versions or, or is that just something he decided to, to do? Oh, he says, show the video in the comments, it's faster. Oh, okay. Can you guys see that or is it cutting off? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, let me increase the quality a little bit here. I have no idea why Facebook defaults to crap quality every time. Probably to match the platform. And now it won't play. Awesome. <laughs> Well, take our word for it, it's faster. <laughs> anyway, uh, Tom, if you have it um, available for download in case anybody wants to try to take a look at the basic code, it, like, you know, we're doing a beginner's assembly course, this would be a good game for a beginner's basic course for writing games too. So uh, I'm gonna post the link. And he said, yes, that's all you could do in G was basic time. So that's why I picked the text characters. Now this one, one of our guests on the Dragon Show next week actually, Chris Poacher, and you, actually, if, you, if you watch the Dragon Preview teaser video we did, he was the very first speaker. So he's the guy who's collecting all the history of MicroDeal. Now, MicroDeal sold for 8 and 16-bit machines through its life, so it was selling for Amigas and Atari STs and some other stuff too. Um, but then this particular picture he put on the uh, private group that he's got for MicroDeal, and we were talking about this earlier, Cuthbert was the official mascot of the Dragon type thing, and you know a lot of games had Cuthbert in the title, like Cuthbert in the Jungle, which is a renamed trap ball from Tom Mix, and Cuthbert goes walkabout, which is an Amadar clone, etc. But what he pointed out here, he didn't just make appearances for his own games. He also appeared in these other titles too. So these are like King Tut, which is originally Atomic's game, Mud Pies, which is a Mictron one we just did recently, Suzuki, which is a Spectral Associates graphical adventure game, Athletics, which is Ken Kalish's Olympic Decathlon, Beam Rider, which is uh, Electric Yo Yo from Spectral, Caverns of Doom, which is a UK original, Eight Ball was from Antico, if I remember correctly. But you'll notice that Cuthbert actually is making his appearance on every single one of these, even though he's not part of the title, he never appears in the game. So, you know, just as the mascot is, he kind of reminds me of Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine and a lot of these here. But uh, yeah, he was definitely was a, a mascot that was quite popular at the time. And, and as Stevie has pointed out, they just did much better with their art because there was no Ziploc baggy cheap crap here with just, you know, colored paper with black text on it. They, they did full color cassette inlays and stuff here too. I have to say the presentation of cassette games, particularly on the Dragon, was much better than almost everything we had up here in North America. And Nick Marentes, if you're still there and still awake, uh, I think Australia was more like the North American market. They didn't get too fancy, except maybe a bit later on. I think he's snoring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cranky. Next up, uh, Lyndon of Old School Games and Stories Channel. Now, we've shown one of his videos where he mentioned that he had a Coco back as a youth, and he still has his very first Coco 2 he got in Christmas of 1984. So we haven't had him, his videos on for a while because he hasn't done any Coco related. So I've actually got two here in this case. So one is his own channel, which is this one here. And he decides to do a, a Let's Play Downland. So just Some cool music. Here. Cocoa nuts come across this. Don't expect me to be spitting out no facts. It kind of sounds I'm like our show, doesn't it? I'm gonna stick to that. That's what I know. You didn't give us a plug in Cocoa Talk. Now, though. I do not know <laughs> of a way to record this. I have a capture card that works on. So he gets in and playing downline. He does one straight playthrough and he's capturing it on his cool iPad because his capture software doesn't do as good of a quality job on the, the video. And the Cocoa 3 we, and Cocos we know of has, has a bit out of sync. Know, RF good, slash so composite, it's, it's not quite, you know, first, proper, so a lot of capture cards have problems with But he actually gets pretty I'm far afraid. into the game. And he's playing with the, the Black Beauties. Like, he's playing with the floating joystick. So that's, okay. on download, that's a challenge. Because you can run off the edge of a rope and plummet to your death quite easily if it doesn't auto-center. Anyway, it's a, it's a pretty good, uh, he doesn't get through every screen, but he gets through the majority of them. I think he gets through like seven or eight of them, so you can you can check that out. And then he'd mentioned during this that he'd just been on another podcast, one I've not seen before. Um, 
on the channel called the Poor Man's Retro Game Room. And it's a series they call the Retro Gaming Roundtable. Now I've seen the Retro Roundtable. And at first glance, I thought from the title, this was like a related one, just gaming with the same people. It's not, it's a totally different show, totally different hosts. But basically in this case, they have episode five, they go through the first and fondest game consoles or home computer consoles, whatever you started your gaming with. And they go through the four people, the host and the three guests, like what was the very first one you ever played and what was the one that out of everything up till now what is the one that holds the most nostalgia for you and uh, Lyndon picked the coco as his first one and kind of went through you know i think his first game was megabug for example so it's a uh, pretty interesting and you get the other people who start with the 2600 or start with the nintendo or whatever else so welcome to episode number five of the retro gaming round table for the user you're into and retro gaming in general and, and topic, art platform specific this is actually looks like a pretty interesting podcast cool so i'd recommend it for those channel. of you that are you know the gaming persuasion from the dad racer youtube channel and we got Lyndon from the old school games and stories channel he's all now, one thing I was thinking here, because they actually are kind of promoting here in the upper left corner here, the various podcasts these people are normally have on their own, is that maybe Nick Moroda or some of our, or maybe Aaron and uh, Boat or something, or you know, some of us in the Coco gaming community might want to get in contact with them and maybe hop on to you know, show off some Coco free stuff or something like that too. So I think that would be pretty interesting. I haven't reached out to them myself because I'm kind of busy with a bazillion other things going on, but any of you gamers out there, this might be an opportunity you know, to plug our show somewhere else because they obviously are plugging the shows of the, the guests as it is. So I don't know if this is like a permanent panel. They're only five episodes in. So maybe they're still figuring it out for themselves, but it might be worthwhile, you know, kind of talking to them, maybe through Linden or through the host directly, maybe leave them a, a message on YouTube and uh, see if we can you know, get some more Coco Game in action on that channel. And that is it for the gaming news this week. Woohoo! Is anybody still awake out there? Nope. Oh, yeah. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you thought you were awake now, you wait till the real news starts here, and then I'll get you right to sleep. Oh, I'm sorry. I think we're having a, ma a, a power outage right now. <laughs> From Coco Talk to Coco Snore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me run the news. Not a ton this week, so that, that'll help. All right, here we go. Here comes the news intro. You know what? Before we do that, let's take a uh, a potty break. Well, Ron's not here, so I guess we'll take a quick break then. <laughs> All right, let me run a commercial real quick, and then we will be right back after these messages. Call, call, talk, will be turn after these messages. Un ordinateur couleur qui a de la personnalité. Le Coco 2 de Radio Sac. On solde pour Noël à partir de 149,95. Coco 2 de Radio Sac, ton affaire est dans le sac. C'est toi, c'est Coco 2. And now, Coco Thought by Samuel Gimes. If you're using your color computer in Quebec and it stops working, is it now a Coco won't do? Hi, Ron Delvo, Timberman, Coco Fest. In a world where RGB produces black and white video, one cable can make a difference. Switcheroo. Coco3scartcable.com Hey, have you got your Coco 3 yet? Hi, this is Rick Adams, author of Temple of Rom and Shanghai, and you've tuned into Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer.
What's going on everybody? Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here, and if you're a fan of vintage computing and retro gaming, then you're going to love our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. There you will find custom designs by Instagram artist Joel M. Adams. You can get I'm a Coconut, Coco Talk, and other cool video game images on a t-shirt, coffee mug, or mouse pack. So if you love retro, then head on over to the retro swag shop at 8bit256.com today. Tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh sent you. Radio Shack Storewide Manager's Red Tag Sale is on now. We've slashed prices 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. Save on famous Radio Shack Hi-Fi, car stereo, radios, toys, TV games, calculators, walkie-talkies, and CB radios. Look for the big red tag. Save like never before on these and literally hundreds of red tag specials. Hurry into Radio Shack today. Hi, this is Randy Kindig of the Foppy Days Podcast. I just love me some cocoa, and nobody covers it better than Steve Strobridge. You're listening to Coco Talk. From around the world, what you need to know. Get caught up on news and Elkers. And now a Muppet News Flash. All right, now we're ready for that favorite time of the show, news with L. Curtis Sleepy. <laughs> Let's say the closing credits. <laughs> Take it away, Curtis. Okay, first up, James Jones found this uh, page here, which is kind of a timeline and history and family tree of operating systems since the 50s. So George probably would know a lot of these ones a lot better than I would, going back further because they go through some of the IBM stuff, the old Unix stuff from the early 70s, et cetera. Um, the cool thing about it is, though, is that OS9 from Microware and Nitrous 9 are both mentioned on it. Now, I wow. did send a bit of a correction to the person here because he's got Nitrous 9 as a completely separate independent operating system, uh, which, you know, it's, it's definitely based on OS9 here. But uh, like here you can see like all the various Unixes and here's HP Unix and you're getting more recent. You can see the time on the top. Now, I had to shrink this down to fit it on screen because this is a large chart. So it's probably not the most readable thing unless you're running in 1080p or higher or something here. But uh, you can see that the timeline goes from 1951 to the present. And he's got color coding here, which he says he's going to explain properly in when he does some updates in the near future here. So I'm not sure what the difference between orange and purple and black and all these other colors he uses are here. You can see more here. There's the mock kernel you know, stuff from the, uh, the Unix side of things. And then you got stuff from Multics here back from the 50s and you know all the various things that came kind of linked from that. And blue is like the CPM branch and all the stuff that came out from CPM. Here's the MS-DOS, PC-DOS, Windows stuff here uh, for the, you know, the Windows that is not the NT kernel. I didn't even heard of dip DOS in the Atari. I don't know what that is. And then Robotron, which I'm not sure. Did they make an operating system based on the arcade game? I'm not sure what that means. Then got some stuff here like Uniflex, which is, I think, a derivative flex, and Smokefield Chieftains, which is not my, another one that actually ran OS 9 back in the day. Like I said, I don't know what the color coding groupings exactly mean. Here's Terrace DOS for Tandy for the, you know, the Model 1, Model 2, Model 3, etc. Turbo DOS. It's a really interesting thing. You can see how these things all, you know, branched off at each other, or at least are grouped on, you know, based on the same principles, but maybe started independently. You can that. see it, it's a huge friggin' list. I didn't know there was that many uh, operating systems out there. Good grief. I didn't either. Half these I have not even heard of. And getting way back to like Sabre IBM in the late 50s. And it's, it's a pretty fascinating tree, though. I mean, I'm a genealogy guy anyway. I have a whole genealogy website in addition to my Cocoa site stuff. So this is kind of like right up my alley. I'm not sure why this Afros has suddenly got a different color than that one thing. I probably have to go follow the connection somewhere else here. But yeah, they got Microware OS 9 in here. And I'm trying to remember where the hell on the screen it is. I should just do a fine. Oops. Yeah, so here's OS 9 RTOS, OS 9000, David, which was their uh, multimedia thing they used for the uh, the CD stuff, 
um, almost 968K from Microware 2. Now this is a little bit inaccurate because our toss was actually the 6800 operating system that Microware did back in 7879 when Ken Kaplan and them were all in college. And then OS 9 came out a couple of years later based on the 679 chip specifically working in conjunction with Motorola when they also created Base 9. So actually that should be a little bit of a branch because uh, six our OS nine actually branched, you know, basically it was based on RTOS, but it wasn't RTOS was not multi-user multitasking. I think it was only one, one of the two, if I remember correctly. And then uh, here they have Nitrous nine group next to the Newtonos for some reason. I have no idea why it's a separate branch. It's not based on anything, but that should be linked somewhat with OS nine. So I, I did send them a correction on that. But just to have it mentioned that was kind of kind of cool. Because I've never been in contact with this person before. The fact they actually know about all this stuff is, is interesting in, in and of itself. Anyway, really cool. So many big thanks to uh, James Jones for finding that. And he posted on Facebook in the um, OS9 Nitrous 9 Facebook group. Because I probably never would have heard of this otherwise. So thank you, James. Hmm. Next up here. And once again, setting Facebook notifications off does not work for some stupid reason. <laughs> Just like much of Facebook. Okay, so Joel Evie published this, and this is, a, I'm not going to try to get into the technical details because, quite frankly, I don't understand most of it, but um, this is about mapping RGB versus composite color spaces. So RGB is based pretty simply on red, green, and blue guns that are, you know, little pixels that light up on your CRT monitor type thing, or your LCD for this matter, or matter these days. And then CMP on the Coco 3 is basically this color wheel here. So you basically you've got a rotating, and it's a phase shift, uh, basically based on phasing. And it basically goes cycles through these colors on the outside wheel. And that's your color zero through 15, zero being black, of course. And uh, basically for every 16 you add, it adds an intensity, which to me, it's adding more white to it. It becomes more white. So you, if you start with color zero, it's black, dark gray, light gray, white. And here you start with dark blue, light blue, you know, all the way up to the lightest blue. And then your various other ones here go through that too. So that's kind of what's set up. But him and, and Robert Galt and John Kowalski, uh, sock master, has been really contributing to the comments in here because there's like si almost 60 comments already on this thread. Going through the, uh, the math to figure out exactly how to map this into modern systems. And if you want to create, you know, like for say Bill Noble's game, if you wanted to create some graphics for the Coco based on modern systems, you can figure out how to translate the RGB values back to composite using this thing. And, and sock master gets into these technical things. Like if you go in the 640 mode, you can actually tell it to be a grayscale display, but because every single pixel is made up of three little mini pixels, red, green, and blue in a triangular shape, he actually explains the math to be able to do artifact coloring on an RGB display using the 640 mode and grayscale to do colors. And then he actually did some samples that he uh, put on later on here. I'll see if I can find one of the screenshots here, but it's pretty incredible stuff. Now here's one, he did 640 by 400 in four shades of gray. And that's what it turns out to be. That's grayscale. Yeah, that's pretty good. I was going to say, that's not bad at all. Yeah, it's not bad at all. Oh, it's John. I mean, what do you expect? I mean, if any miracle stuff's going to happen, it's going to be from him. But uh, And then he goes through, like, different algorithms. Well, I change this little thing here. And he's calculating, like, you know, if you're on every four pixels, if you're on the far left one, like, the first gray, it'll light up 13% of the green pixel under in the, in the CRT and 60% of the red and 12% of the blue, so you can calculate all the different offsets here to figure out exactly where your color is going to show up. And like I said, it's way the hell over my head. But the results speak for themselves. That's pretty darn amazing for a gray scale. That's pretty picture. good. Yeah. <laughs> what movie is that from? I don't recognize off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> One of you guys, I'm just imagining a sci-fi sci movie of some sort. But That's damn good. Yeah, so uh, Nick Mirandi's obviously you have some work cut out for you because now you can make all these composite games and stuff look awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so get on that. You're going to have to backport all your games to use this new technique. <laughs> huh. But anyway, if you're really into that uh, color stuff, and speaking of color here, this is from a Daniel O'Connor. So she's got her two Cocoa 3 set up here, and the one on the far right is on an RGB slash you know, VGA display, and the one on the left is PAL. And PAL composite. Um, now, one, what? No, the one on the right, it looks like it's on the CM8. Yeah, that's VJ slash RGB is what she labeled it as. So that's oh, what RGB, yeah. RGB. Sorry, yeah. I thought you said, yeah. I said both because that's what she labels yeah. it as. It'll look the same in both places. The left is a PAL composite out. 
And look yeah. how sharp. I mean, the colors are a little bit different. In fact, they look a little bit better. Actually, like the yellow in particular looks more contrasty myself and you know, the cyan and stuff. But I mean, that just shows you how good the color accuracy on PAL, which actually is tapping RGB signals um, directly to create the PAL signal, where it looks compared to composite that we got. The disadvantage, of course, is that artifact colors don't exist. Or you know, there's a little bit of a vertical one, but it doesn't look quite as good or as you know, striking as it does on the Apple II or the, the Cocoa on NTSC. But it, it definitely showed that the uh, the text quality and the color quality, if you're using a color mode that is a proper color mode, did look far better on PAL than it ever did in NTSC, as, yeah. as most Australians and UK people already know. Yep, we know. <laughs> Next up, uh, Sheldon McDonald, who we had as a guest here recently, um, is putting the finishing touches together for a new drawing program for P Mode One. Now he's demonstrated his whole you know, disk utility stuff that actually can write and, you know, do assembly and basic programs directly to disk images. And he's done his whole graphics library that he's been doing, you can call them assembly, that we demonstrated, uh, was it two weeks ago? No, I can't remember now. But basically he's been adding more stuff to it. So he's got a P mode zero, a P mode one editor here. We can actually convert, you know, stuff back and forth. And he just posted this uh, last night, uh, going through some details of some stuff he's adding and this is still work in progress very much so but he also posted a youtube video this morning which i haven't actually had a chance to fully watch yet uh kind of demonstrating this now it's a fairly long one so i'm not going to play the whole thing it's 13 and a half minutes but i'll just maybe play some snippets and oh, see if it's interesting uh, i'm going to do a quick uh, demonstration today using my new drawing program for p mode one for the color computer um I'm going to just kind of go over how to use this tool and uh, how it can benefit assembly language uh, programming. Okay, um, so you got all your functions here on the right side of it. Um, I'm going to take this debug thing out before it gets released. Um, you'll notice that uh, if, I'm, if I'm on a draw mode, um, so you see these... Uh, these nine boxes on the top corner here. It just shows you where your mouse is currently going to be editing. So, for example, if I was to click just below this, it should become a yellow dot. Um, if you are using a box, um, it's, oh, and this big box here is obviously the color that you've selected. Um, so we're going to use box mode and up here it says mode box. So if I wanted to draw a box from say there to there, um, that's how that would be done. I'll just pause it for a second. Like I know Nick, you've been working with some of Sheldon's tools or at least you're fairly enamored with them. Have you had any experience with this stuff yet or is this no, totally no, internal I haven't. Game? Yeah, that's internal to him. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, he's got all these different things. So he starts demonstrating the various clips and stuff there, um, you know, different functions like boxes and lines and how to switch colors, et cetera. And they also showed does some importing of uh, you know graphics from other places and then talks about the exporting and stuff too. Um, there's one doing one in artifact colors, for example. So it looks like a pretty useful tool if you're gonna be drawing shapes and stuff. Um, and currently this is for the P mode one and it works along with this P mode one library stuff and assembly that he's done before too. So uh, it's, it's definitely, it's a, it's a really nice library if you're gonna be doing graphics programming on the Cocoa and assembly language rather than having to figure out how do you use a Bresenham algorithm to draw a line? Well, you know, that stuff's built into the library. So you just call it with, you know, here's the start point, here's the end point, go draw a line for me. Kind of like you would in basic. So it's, it's nice having an assembly language library, especially for beginners who just wanna, you know, prototype a game or prototype a screen or something like that, not have to, figure out all the ins and outs of every little drawing a pixel at a time yourself. Anyway, like I said, I won't play the whole thing. It's definitely worth a watch though, if you're into that whole development system that uh, Sheldon's been coming up with. Next up, <clears throat> Retro Rick, and we've shown a couple betas of this before. So this is his uh, maze generating program, which he's now got ported to Coco one and twos with only 16 K of RAM, though it runs in low res. He's also got a Dragon 3264 version of it now. He's also got a Coco 3 version. And this is his actual full official release of version 4. So it's a little bit faster. He's going to demonstrate the Coco 3 version in this particular video. Now, once again, I won't play the whole thing here. So you have this thing where you can actually select the width and the height 
of the maze and you can get pretty high with that and then it has a little you know status it's a little bit faster than even the previous alpha was and then he has a little hourglass and i'll just play a little bit of his uh, auto solving part of it here so it's generating and this is all in basic So for those you want to make a you know a, a maze platformer type thing, or maybe a dungeon game or something like that, I mean this this Rutini's got you can actually you know set it up to save the maps as you create them, so you can actually you know make levels without actually having to design them yourself. You can just have it do it, and it's a solvable maze every time. So, and he goes through a couple of the different modes that he's got running on it here. It's fun. So if you got a higher res maze, you can't fit the fancy shaded graphics. It'll just do the line style thing like the screensaver in, in Micro Sign does, or one of the screensavers, that one that Brian Schubring runs all the time. And then, like I said, he's got Coco 1 and 2 versions that do it lower res, and he's also got the Dragon version, which uses a bit more RAM, so it's a bit more advanced than the 16K Coco version. But all, all those versions should be available for download now. Next up is a Jim Gary one. Now I didn't include this in the regular Jim Gary stuff because it's not a game. So it's not, I didn't put in the game on news. Um, it might be of interest to Ron DeVoe if he's, if he's still around or not asleep or something. Um, but basically it's Phases de la Lune, which is French for Phases of the Moon. Originally programmed by Philip. I don't know if I can try to pronounce his last name. But basically you get to pick, and it, this uses uh, a bit more uniquely, this uses the 64 by 48 semi-graphic six graphics mode. The normal low res graphics mode is 64 by 32 with eight colors. This uses a couple pokes to get it to run the 640, 64 by 48 by four color mode. So it's slightly higher vertical res. You get about 50% more pixels up and down than would normally. So you get kind of a smoother, you know, look at the moon here. And it kind of created a fake little text font using the graphics here, but you're limited to four colors at this point. So let's go to the next one here. That's pretty close to a full moon. One Where are you give us? <laughs> So what'd you say? What 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 semi graphics mode is this? Six. Six. Yeah. So the, nor the normal what... set reset is semi graphics four, which is sixty four by yeah. thirty two effective. This is sixty four by forty eight effective, but you only get four colors. Oh, okay. I did not. And, Why would you only get four colors? Well, it uses the extra bit bits to do the extra dots because it, it does the same dot grid that the model one and three do two by three pixel. Oh, okay. Per character versus the two by two that we're used to. And that has been supported in the VDG since day one. And just uh, most people didn't bother using it. And Jim's used it on a few of his games before too. So if you just need a little bit of extra res and you don't mind being limited to four colors, it's kind of a cool way to get a little bit extra with the same amount of space. It only takes 512 bytes per screen. And in uh, four by three displays, it gets square pixels. Oh, right. Yeah, that is one other thing. And then we know that Nick loves his square pixels. Well, well I use semi graphics. Circles, you kind of want that, otherwise, you got to do it on yeah. your scale. Yeah, you got to scale it. I mean, I've used semi graphics eight, but it's it's eight colors. So, anyway, I haven't looked yeah, at it. Yeah, but those take yeah. like a K, 2K of screen, and you can't use regular yeah. you know, basic stuff on it here. You can kind of fake it a bit. Yeah, I didn't realize there was a four color semi graphics mode. Yeah, it takes the same space as the semi graphics four. It just that it, it, it trades color for resolution, basically, is what it does. And then the last one here is a, a Dragon News one. Uh, so, John Whitworth, who will be on our show next week, uh, along with over a dozen other guests, and he's kind of one of the hardware guys. These guys have been doing the MSX2 Plus board, which will be renamed, and hopefully, we'll find what the real name is going to be for the final product on the show next week. Plug, plug. So uh, one thing they've been having problems with in the Dragon scene is that the Dragon power supply boards, which is the part of the power supply that's inside the Dragon itself, um, has a tendency to die after some time, and there's not really a replacement for it. And uh, he's got a schematic here that was created by somebody else, and he's got permission from them. This is Phil Harvey Smith uh, to make a replacement board. So right now what he's trying to find out is how much 
interest is there in getting some of these boards to be able to manufacture them? Because you can get the prices down, of course, with the more boards you get manufactured, same as Pedro was talking about earlier uh, about the Coco 3 board. You know, you, the more you buy, the, the cheaper it gets. So he's going right now, he knows that he can get it for about 33, 50 pounds for a kit version 40 for a full built one. Um, unfortunately, right now, because chip shortages and everything else everywhere else, it's got a six to seven week lead time. So if you do need one right away, don't expect to get it for a couple of months once you even get some, you know, started manufacturing. But, you know, the Dragons have the same issue that some of the Cocoa people have, you know, certain chips and certain parts of the machine are not replaceable with current parts. Which is what Pedro has been trying to, you know, fix up in his Coco One Two design, we're creating the Pepper, a little daughter board that replaces the salt chip type thing. So this is to replace the uh, power supply portion of the motherboard on the Dragon. So if any of you have Dragons out there and are interested in getting a replacement power supply board because you're starting to flake out or you have one that's bad in the Dragon's dead, please contact John Whitworth on the Dragon Facebook group or even you know mention it to him on the show next week when he's on. And uh, he can kind of gauge, you know, how many to order. Maybe he can get the prices down lower if he gets enough people to, to order. And that is the end of the news this week. Awesome. So a quick plug for the next three weeks, we've got guests. So next week, of course, is the big Dragon Talk special, which is going to have the regular panel of 15 to 20 people, plus a Dragon panel of 12 to 15 people. Um... Plus, I'm imagining a larger size chat room than normal. It's going to be a long show. It's going to be an awesome show. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. Hardware, software, game streaming, all kinds of things that are going to be happening. The week after that, uh, one of the guests on next week's Dragon Show is Stuart Orchard, who's a Dragon game programmer, both from back in the day. He wrote a couple of games back in the late 80s. Baldozer, which is an Arkanoid clone with some extra bits that Arkanoid didn't have. And then he also did, uh, I'm going to abbreviate his road tab. It was Return of the Alien Bongo Beast from the Chrissy Crossy Line Dimension. So I can't remember <laughs> one. Um, which is kind of a four way space shooter flying over a grid. It's got some pretty neat effects in it at different parts of the game, some decent sound routines. And the recent one he's done is uh, Return of the Beast, which uh, if you'd watched the Megathon thing that Nick and Steve and I did for part of the fundraiser for the Miracle Children's Network. We actually played that game because the, the sound music routine at the beginning is awesome. It's one of the best theme song things I've heard on a Coco 1, 2 slash Dragon level machine. The Coco 3, we know because of extra speed and the gimme timer interrupt can do better, better than that. But for that level of machine, it's pretty awesome. And it's a smooth scrolling four-way shoot em up. Now, he's listed it as a beta. Uh, one thing I'll be asking him on the show next week is why does he consider it bad? Because it's a fully playable game and it's scoring. You can die, you can shoot things, you can warp between levels. I don't know if maybe he had planned to add you know, big boss aliens or something to it later. Maybe that's why he considers it unfinished. To me, it's a fully playable game as it is. And maybe we can encourage him to quote unquote finish whatever the extra stuff he wanted to do was. So he's going to be our interview guest the week after on the 21st. And of course, we have Glenn Delger and his Sun Dog Systems who programmed a ton of graphical adventure games like uh like um they did some coco 3 specific ones he did the uh hall of the king trilogy series he also did stuff like him guy to be ninja that bill had mentioned earlier that i uh, mentioned got poor dose nine he did warrior king um kung fu dude you know a bunch of others and he also published on behalf of other authors he did stuff like sinistar and photon and uh graphic express 2.0 and crystal city and xenix and a bunch of others i mean sundog was the premier coco game company during its last last years i mean you basically took over from daikon as being the premier one so he'll be our guest on the 28th and he'll also be promoting his new book his new fantasy novel which is actually a prequel to the one when he showed us on the last time he was on the show and i will mention we're trying to get a lot of the dragon guests to come on starting in september uh as guests too to give them a more time to talk about all the stuff they've done because some of them have done so much stuff you couldn't fit in 15 minutes no way um, there's also some other guests we're trying to get on that are not related to the dragon. And there's at least two that I'm talking to right now. I'm not going to announce them until we got anything official on it, but uh, it looks like we're going to have a lot of, you know, full length interviews coming up here. Um, starting in, you know, well, starting next week, but going off into September, October, November, right up through Christmas, we can probably get, you know, some every couple of weeks or so is what I'm kind of hoping to do. So keep your eye and ears out for that. There'll be a lot of interesting people to talk to. 
We'll try to announce them as far ahead as we can so you guys can kind of review the stuff they've done. If you have any questions, it'll give you some time to do it. Now, I will mention for the Dragon Show next week because it's going to be such a huge friggin' panel. We're going to have to do things a little bit different as far as taking questions. So we're going to have a huge local panel of all of us regular Cocoa Talk people. We're going to have a huge panel of Dragon people. And we're going to have a larger than normal chat room because people from the Amigo Show uh, audience might be showing up. The Dragon audience obviously will be showing up. So I think we're going to have to have it so that when the people are doing the presenting, we're going to have like no interruptions during the actual presentation of whatever they want to talk about. And then we'll have to take the actual questions for them, I think, in three chunks. We'll probably start with the dragon, fellow dragon people themselves, because they're the special guests. We'll give them priority so they can ask. And a lot of these dragon people don't even know each other because they're from such different walks of dragon life. So we'll let them do the first set of questions. Then maybe we'll get the chat room questions and then we'll get the Cocoa Talk regular panels. But we'll do it in groups those three different groups here to help keep it from people talking over each other and, you know, just turning into a schmozzy mess of, of noise. So it'll be a little bit of a different format than normal because of that. And of course, we'll be stripping a lot of the regular features up just because, you know, we're going to be concentrating on this. It's kind of like the Dragon Virtual Cocoa Fest almost at this point. There'll be some, you know, new stuff demo. There'll be some old stuff demo. There'll be talks. We've got Duncan Smeedy worked from Dragon back in the day and helped port the ROMs over uh, from Microsoft and did them his own custom stuff. So he was involved with Dragon right from the manufacturing side of the software and the ROMs. Uh, we've got game streamers, we've got game developers, hardware developers, utility programmers, all kinds of people. So it's going to be a nice, nice variety. So you can get your questions ready for that next week. Um, and any questions for Stuart Orchard on the three games he's done? I've got Baldozer. Now, one thing I will mention my game site. I've got a couple of the games. We've got at least three game developers coming on. We've got Karen Anscombe, who's also in the chat, Sixy, who's done Dungeons. And uh, that's what I'm just doing right now. My mind's blanking because I'm doing so much right now. But basically, i got a couple of his games. I've got Steve Ascombe, who did Flag and Bird and is working on Cersei's Island currently. Bamford. Uh, would... What's that? Bamford. Bamford? Steve. What did I say? <laughs> Something else. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Steve Bamford. <laughs> Yeah, Bosco. I should have just called him that. Um, and of course, Stuart Orchard himself, too. So, I mean, we've got three game developers. I've got two games out of all of theirs combined, I think, on the site right now. I've actually got two more that I've submitted to the authors to kind of review the page. And I've got two more to do yet. So I'm hoping to get those all done this weekend. I'll try to make them live by Monday at the latest so that anybody wants to kind of research their games before they're on the show next week and kind of get a feel for what questions they may want to ask. Um, so check our Discord. I'll announce on there when I've got the page updated. And if you have an RSS feed turned on to the games page, you should get an automatic notification uh, when those pages go live. So get your questions ready. Get your questions ready for Stuart the following week. Get your questions ready for Glenn Dahlgren the following week after that. And uh, we'll keep announcing more guests as we get them booked. Hopefully Atari Leaf took us seriously because I would like to get him on the show too. Anyway, that's my spiel for now. Awesome. Cool. Well, while well, we got a couple minutes here, I just wanted to share with you guys some of the stuff that I have been getting off of eBay. So I'm going to give Brian Weasler a run for his money this week. <laughs> you sure about that? <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> uh, I got a brand new Arkanoid, brand new in package. Cool. One, of my, one of my favorite games. I got the uh, Flight Simulator 2 with the disc as well. Unfortunately, I don't have the... Uh, I guess there's an error you said, uh, Curtis, that I need to get from you uh they made a mistake in the uh publication on the hot keys. no it's an addendum for the coco there's a little single double-sided sheet that has some special extra keys and special extra things unique to the coco version okay cool which came with the package now did you get both books with it because there's the actual manual and there's also the flight handbook which came with the original package nope just got the one little thin book with it unfortunately so okay uh i got the uh phantom graph brand new in package as well and then this one here, I think uh, a lot of people have been looking for, which is uh, the 6809, uh, what is it? The uh, Assembly Language Programming by Lance Leventhal. Leventhal yeah. Yep. So that's uh, it's pretty hard to come by. Yours is in much better shape than mine. Mine has been used so much, it's pretty well falling apart at this point. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. Uh, then I also have the uh, Rainbow Book of Simulations. Got that as well, too. Unfortunately, I only got the. I think, this, I think this is the first version of it too. I think there's like three. Is that correct, Curtis? Sorry, what was that? No, it's bringing a comment. Uh, I think this is. There's three of these, and I only got the first one. So. Yeah, the second one's yellow for the simulation. Actually, was there a third simulation? I can't remember. There's four adventure books. I can't remember. If there's two or three simulation books. 
I know. There was only two. Was there only two? Okay. Uh, and then I also have Face Maker, uh, which I think was for the Coco Coco One and Two, 16K. And then I also have Home Publisher, brand new in a box as well. And then Basic 09, brand new in a box as well. Well, not brand new, but in a box. <laughs> yeah, that's a level one version because it came bundled with level two. Exactly. So hopefully I beat Brian Riesler for the week. Since he's not here, I did definitely beat him. So. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, there's a correction from the, the, the chat here from multiple people pointing out how wrong I am. Uh-oh. Um, so Jim Gary and Sixty Kieran all mentioned that the, uh, well, technically the Semigraphic 6 does support the four colors, as I said. The way it's implemented on the Coco and on the MC10, it actually only does two. <laughs> so once again, you know, Tandy being cheap, they didn't put a couple extra wires. It might have cost him a penny or two. So it's a, a little bit crippled from the uh, what what the chip's actually capable of doing. As, as Jim Gary said, yep, 6 SG6 is a little hobbled on the Coco and the MC10. Just a few more wires, sad face. <laughs> oh, so it, it's only on the MC10, that limitation of four colors or two colors. Well, he's saying on the Coco too, so I'm. Oh, okay. Now I'm confused. You yeah, must the... say Coco as well. Yeah, the Barden Graphics book covers Semigraphic Six and, and it its says... color limitations and why. So it has something to do with the inverse bit being used for inverse and everything else as well. So there's just not enough room in, for the VGG signals that were needed. So yeah, annoying. So you can get like blue and yellow in one mode and uh, magenta and orange in the other mode. Highly useful color palettes. <laughs> so yeah, if I, you I don't understand why you've only got two colors in that mode, yet if you go to Semi-Graphics 8, you do get eight colors. The inverse bit got used uh, instead of the next bit for the rest of the color. Yeah, that 60 is saying six bits dedicated to the pixel data, one bit selects graphics mode and leaving only one bit for color selection. Yeah, so if you want square pixels, go with Semi-Graphics 12 and draw them twice. And then you get the right. nine colors. Okay, or Semi-Graphics 8 does that automatically as one, one per. Yeah, yeah, eight's good. Anyway, thanks, thanks for the correction. I always love being proven wrong live on air, so. Oh, our pleasure. <laughs> I'm used often. to it, trust me. You deserve it. Well, I think Curtis is always wrong, right? Pretty much. <laughs> Those damn Canadians. <laughs> We're polite about it, though. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Was there anything else that uh, we need to discuss before we uh, end the show for this week? Did, did anybody else have any uh, acquisitions or you know little minor project updates I didn't get to mention in the first chunk? I actually forgot to mention one thing on my new graphics library. Sure. Is I'm actually looking at DinoSprite right now, and I'm finding a lot of things from DinoSprite that I can actually port into this new graphic engine. So, oh, be, cool. Be on the lookout for that. All right. Awesome. Well, after we do all our big interviews here, we'll have to have you back on to demo it. Yes. <laughs> Go, Garrett. All right. Awesome. Anybody else have anything else before we push the button? Uh, uh, 60 said he's glad to be of service and proving me wrong. So no thanks. <laughs> but... <laughs> All right. Well, we will see you guys, everybody, back next week, same time, same place, for the huge 17-hour-long Dragon Show. Yeah, make sure you have your adult diapers handy because you don't want to miss a minute of it. So, <laughs> and, Or you and... just live stream like Grant does. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. And El Curtis Boyle will be providing lunch and dinner for everybody that watches the show that day, that week. Yeah, week. You have to come up here to get it, though. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We will see you guys next week for the uh, Dragon Special. Otherwise, uh, you guys have a great week. And until next time. This concludes another episode of Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things Coco Talk, visit us on the web at cocotalk.live. We'd love to hear from you. 
Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live. Consider supporting the show with a purchase of merchandise from our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, click on the Patreon link on our website, cocotalk.live. Coco Talk would not exist without the community, its cast, crew, and contributors. Thanks go to Alan Murphy, Bill Noble, Brian Joyce, Brian Weasler, Curtis Boyle, D. Bruce Moore, Danny O'Connor, David Ladd, Eric Canales, Grant Leedy, James Diffendaffer, Jason Reichert, Jim Brain, Ken Reichert, Mark Bosley, Mark Overholzer, Mikey Furman, Mr. Dave 6309, Nick Morentes, Nick Morota, Nick Morota, Nick Morota, Paul Fiscarelli, Richard Lorbieski, Rick Adams, Rick Eulin, Rob Inman, Ron Del Vaux, Samuel Gimes, Sloopy Malibu, Steve Bjork, Terry Steggy, Tom C., and many more. Please help support the Coco community. A list of various contributors and resources are available at imacoconut.com. That's I-M-A-C-O-C-O-N-U-T dot com. The original Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2008 by D. Bruce Moore and Greg Sheeler. The new Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2020 by D. Bruce Moore. Both are mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. Coco forever, people!